Okay, so uh, good morning. Today's date, uh, March 6, 2022. I am with uh, Pat Inglis and uh, Judith Garraway. I will also have uh, their brother as well. And, and uh, Judith, what, what is your brother's full name? Derek Isaac Garway. So these are Derek Isaac Garway, Pat Garway, Pat Inglis, and, and Judith Garway are uh, the uh, illustrious uh, business leaders and descendants of the uh, well respected Garway family of Dominica who were involved in agriculture and industry of my youth. Uh, right before we started this program, <clears throat> I noted to Judith and to Pat that my first job was at the JAS Garway factory, Hillsborough Cigarette Factory, 1970. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. So, uh, Pat, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Judith. And what I'll do is I'll just ask a few questions having to do with your early life and so on. So you don't have to give me the exact date if you don't want to. But before, before you do that, we have prepared some history on the Fugari family, where they came from, who are the Fugari, and how they came Indeed, indeed. Oh, so. Absolutely. And, and that's what I intended to do, actually. So you preempted me. But can you come a little closer to the um, microphone? Because you were talking very clearly. But say, say a few words now. Let me hear with the quality. Can you hear me now? I can, but it's a little faint. A little faint. So let me see if the volume on this is, is um, right. Yes, it's right. Yeah, it's right. Can or you can just bring your chair a little closer because I could hear you very loud and clear earlier. Yeah, I don't know why it's, you don't hear me now. I don't know if it's since you put on the recorder. If you could stay like right around where you are, I could hear, I could hear you. Okay, you can hear me better now. Much better than a while ago. Okay, good, okay. So I can go ahead? Yes. So why don't you go ahead, um, Judith, and kind of give us a history of the Garway family in Dominica, where it came from, when it first arose in Dominica, and the like. Okay, so I'll just do read it because we prepared something so we could have it as a background, you know? Yes. Uh, introduction. Okay, earliest record show they originated from Middlesex and Hertfordshire in England in 1135 AD. The Garway name is an anglo welsh surname. In later years, some of them moved to Ireland around the 1400s to the 1500s. Robert Garraway was born in Londonderry Island in 1751 and died in Dominica in 1830. Robert arrived in Dominica around 1805 and he had two sons. They were James and Robert. Frederick Garraway and Robert Garraway were cousins. And Frederick Garry was the son of planter Frederick Hervey Garry, and was born in Dominica in 1818, but resided for a while in Middlesex, England. Frederick Garry died in 1876 in Dominica. George Garry was also born in Dominica in 1821 and died in June 1869 in Dominica. Frederick and George were the sons of Frederick Hervey Garry. However, James was the father of Robert Frederick Garraway, who was born in 1860 and died in 1945. That is our grandfather. Robert Frederick was the father of Robert Alexander Garraway, who is our father, and who was born on January 15, 1903. That's Robert, our father, he was born on January 15, 1903, and he died on 4th June 1971 in Dominica. Our father had three sons by his first wife, Isla Benjamin, that's the, the mother of Tony, Alec, and Michael Garry. And he had six children with our mother, his second wife, Phyllis Schlingford. And these are Jim, Newton, Derek, Pat, Judith, and Kathleen. Kathleen and myself being fraternal twins. He also fathered a daughter, Marion Garry, who you might know as Marion Elvis. Mother of Heather, Jennifer, Ralph, Clayron, and that branch. 
surviving children as of today are Tony and Gary in the Bahamas. He's 90 years old. And all of us who are still surviving from his marriage to Phyllis Schillingford. Phyllis Gary was born on 31st January 1912 and she died on 27th May 2003. So that gives you a synopsis of where they came from and how long ago they came to Dominica. Amazing. So again, um, <clears throat> Robert Gary, who was from Londonderry, Ireland, was born in 1757 and came to Dominica. 1751. In 1751, I'm sorry, and came to Dominica. What year? 1805. 1805, and died in 1830. That's right, and that's the father of James Gary, famous Jazz Gary, which you see on Hillsborough Factory. I see. So Jazz Gary, J A S Gary, what did that stand for? James. James Alexander something, I suppose. I don't know this S what the S stands for, but Sam Derrick would be able to tell you. But James, and, Gary, Jazz Gary is a short form of his initials. So Jazz he would have been the son of, of, um, of Robert Garraway. Yes, Robert Garraway, the one who was born in Ireland. I see. Dominica in 1805. So, so did James Garraway ever own like a sugar mill or, or plantation? How did he make his money? Well, I don't know about that, but all I know is that he was the original owner of the Hillsborough factory. And I, I see. wonder because he was in tobacco and all that on the Hillsborough estate. You remember my line? You own it. Going yeah, of line. course. I, I remember the Hillsborough street. My father worked on the Hillsborough right. street. So as a that, is, that is who started yes. this factory. Yes. You know what is interesting is that after the war, my father worked as a clerk at the Hillsborough Estate. My mother's mother and my mother worked on the Hillsborough Estate. My mother was from was from St. Joseph. Um, and, good morning. Good morning, Derek. Not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. You know, the... Genetics, genetics is a is a is a great science. You know, when I look at you, I see Judith, I see Pat. You know, but um, we're we're just talking about uh, a few interesting things that my mother and her mother, my grandmother, worked on the Hillsborough Estate. They told me that they used to pay them for picking caterpillars off the of the leaf. The caterpillars were like a pest, and they would pay you based on the amount, the amount of caterpillars that you could show that you had picked up. And they do that. They do that in the summer. They do that in the summer when they are off for school. And that when my father left the army in 1947, he worked as a clerk at the Hillsborough Estate and was recruited then by the chief forestry officer, Bora, to serve as a soil conservation officer in the Lai Valley where he met our mother. So in, a, in an interesting way, you know, my mother meeting my father had a lot to do with the Garraway Estate. And I was telling <laughs> Judith and Pat before you came in, Derek, that when I was at the Goodwill Junior High School in 70, 1970, Summer of 70, my mother got me a job at the tobacco factory, right there on Old Street across from Barclays Bank. And my job at nine years old was to sit on a box and to take the rejected cigarettes. Some cigarettes would come out too short or too long. And I would have to recover the tobacco, put it in a box so they could replace, or they could take that tobacco that was recycled and put it back into the hopper to have it be processed again. So I worked for two weeks and I got the princely sum of $2 EC for my for my labors. That was my first job. Nine years old. I was nine in 1970. I was born in 61. So, so you know, uh, there's a connection there. But let me, let me ask a question. I will start with uh, uh, you, uh, Derek. Um, you're the only male. You, you're born in, uh, where were you born and when were you born? Yeah, I, I see we're going to have a little bit of the a little bit of an audio problem because I can hear Derek, but very very faintly, right? So I'm wondering whether you could get a little closer to the microphone, and and see whether that's better. Yeah. If you're on a laptop, are you on a laptop or desktop? No desktop. Okay, that's much better. I, I could hear that now. 
Okay, so you're born in Portsmouth, Dominica, right? I'm not, I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a question of the volume. Do you have the access to the volume control on your machine? That's what I do. Yeah, I play the volume raiser again. Oh, I'll tell you, see if you can work on the volume control. Let me speak to Pat. Pat, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, Pat, your voice is loud and clear. That's, that's, uh, I wish they could, uh, you know, maybe uh, find a way to use your machine. So where were you born and when were you born, Pat? I was born in Portsmouth on the 15th of October, 1946. And your parents? Phyllis Garraway and Robert Alexander Garraway. And Phyllis's maiden name? Chillingford. And was she the daughter of A.C. Chillingford? No, no, she was the daughter of Thomas Howard Chillingford. I see, Thomas Howard Chillingford. And, and your father, let me have your father's first name again. Robert Alexander Garraway. Okay, and he would have been the grandson of J.A.S. Garraway. Um, was it James Garraway, the um, Judith? Was Garraway, the father of our grandfather. Right. Okay. So, so my father would have been the son of Robert Frederick Garraway or Robert yeah. Robert Frederick, right? Yes. Outstanding. And so, where did you attend school in Portsmouth? I went to Portsmouth. Um, say, what, um, what was it? Portsmouth um, School. What they call government school. Government Portsmouth school. government school. It's no and, um, primary, I yes. Okay. And at, at, at ten years old, I moved to Rosa because, as you know, all these secondary schools were in Rosa at that time. Yes. I in fact did get a scholarship, but because of the fact that they said, my, said at that time my father could afford it, I didn't get it. I was not awarded it. Okay. So, and so 10, you, you took the common entrance. That you took the common entrance. No, you didn't have 10. common entrance at that time. Oh, well, how did you get to high school then? <laughs> whatever it had, you had to sit at test anyway. Standard certificate, several standard certificates. Remember? Okay. They didn't have common entrance. They called it seven standard. Seven standard certificate. Yes, that's right. Okay, and so you took that seven standard certificate. You got a scholarship, but was, was not awarded it because of economic your economic status. And you went to the convent high school. No, no, Wesley High School. Wesley High School. It's In amazing days, because my mother was very adamant that she was not going to send us to any Catholic school because she had attended West High School. And I remember her saying, once you had certain skills, remember it was in nuns in those, in those days, they yes. would manipulate you that you join the Catholic Church. And she was not going to allow that. <laughs> was your mother a Methodist then or Anglican? Anglican, strong, Anglican. strong Anglican. <laughs> yes, and, and of course the Anglican Church did not have a high school, it was the Wesley High School, Convent High School for girls. That's and it. And St. Mary's Academy and Dominic no, Grammar no, School for I don't think St. Mary's Academy was there at the time. It was Grammar School. Yes. Oh, well, the Academy was founded in the 30s, huh? So it would have been there when you came to town. I used to see the boys walking to SMG all the time. Yes, yes. Well, maybe I don't recall it anyway, because I mean, most of the friends I had had attended Grammar School. Yes. But before you got you, you get into like um, your time in Roseau, tell us what it was like growing up at Portsmouth at that time. Well, it was the most wonderful childhood that I had because those days you went to the sea, you would come back at six o'clock in the evening, you'd walk barefoot, you could go to um, Bell Hall at that time. We would spend almost every Sunday at the sea. When we left home, which we couldn't leave until we repeated the entire colic for the Sunday. So after we left church, we had to come home, cram. That's when I learned to cram the best that I, as fast as I could. And we had to repeat the whole colic and then we could go to the beach and we would spend time at the beach and come back late in the evening. But of course, you had to be home by six o'clock. I mean, in those days we had fowls. We used to walk to one mile to get Zeb in that time to feed the fowls. 
We used to collect the eggs for our breakfast. We used to um, prepare our coffee by grinding it and, you know, drawing it and using cow's milk. We didn't know what all this evaporated milk was. Yes. And um, I remember Derek hating the cream of the milk. You know, when you boil the cow's milk, there's a cream. And he yes. used to climb up to take a strainer to, to strain all the remnants of the cream. Now, I love the cream, so I would put yes. it in that coffee. That was excellent. <laughs> You know, yes, so indeed. those days were great days. We used to go to the bay to buy fish every day. We would yes. go to the market on a Saturday to buy meat. And I yes. always remember we used to be fighting, you know, to find yourself in front. Mr. Nixon, look at me. Mr. Nixon, look at me. I want five pounds. I, want to... <laughs> I mean, you thought nothing of it. But these were the days. I mean, we didn't know what it was to freeze anything. Yes. Or you, you didn't have a refrigerator in those days. No, we had a kerosene refrigerator, but we, we didn't freeze and defrost. We would cook almost every day. I see, know? Yes, yes. And yes. then our mother ensured that we had chores. And yes. um, Judith and Kathleen were responsible for breakfast. One was, one was responsible for breakfast. I would do lunch and then dinner. And of course, yes. we always sat at the table with our parents to eat, whether it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You yeah. know, you had to be there. So there was a certain discipline that you had. Yeah. I mean, we had in those days, you had sil to silver all the um, cutlery. And that was yeah. something you had to silver everything, wash it and put it back. For those I mean, people who do not know, silver was something out of a little can. <laughs> it was a liquid made in Britain. There was brass for brass and right. silver for silver. And you would have to use it to shine. Is that right? Yes. And in those days, you had um, brasso doorknobs, so you had to brasso, because the houses of those days, you know, and yes. you had to brasso all those doorknobs, shine it. I mean, it was a discipline that, you know, it does, you don't see in those days. Yes, you know? indeed. Let, At that time, let me my ask, mother was uh -huh. you. Did mm -hmm. you ahead. have organizations like the Boy Scouts or Girl Guides? Well, I didn't join Girl Guides. My mother used to be the... Um, was it Judy Wilmore tell you about that? She was the guide commissioner for the North, but she was yes. always brought up in girl guides and Judy basically took away from her, took over yeah. from her. So yeah. I joined the Red Cross when I came to Roseau. Okay. And I remember that, you know, Winifred Watty was one of the <laughs> people involved and she taught us how to make beds, how to, because I think she used to be a nurse before and she teach us how to take care of the patient on the side of the bed. So I learned a lot from her in those days. But Indeed. Judith can tell you about um, the um, guiding movement because my mother is very instrumental in, 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 that, in that area. She was also president of the Women's Institute where she taught people how to embroidery, crochet, tie. She, was, she did Pitman shorthand, several people she trained and we, we ourselves had to learn almost everything from her. So those days were basically community-minded and learning to, you know, developing your, your, your skills and your qualities and various disciplines. Of course, she played the piano. So all of us had to learn to play the piano. I mean, we had to do chores and then you could go do something else. Indeed. You know, um, uh, Pat, I, I, I started listening to you talk about the Women's Institute and I, I didn't know that Dominique had a Women's Institute until I interviewed our mother for her book in, 19, in 2017. She said that there was a women's institute during the war. There was a 4-H club during the war. So it says to me that in, in those days, we had a more developed community sort of um, institutional base by which people would learn uh, socialization skills and also vocational skills. Is that correct? Right. And then she was very instrumental. I mean, almost all the wives, because remember, she was a housewife. But people like Mrs. Bertrand, Mrs. Warty, um, Mrs. Robinson, so many people were part of that institute. And, you know, they were so um, um, what is it, committed to ensuring they passed on knowledge. I mean, I mean, hundreds of women in Portsmouth were, in, were involved and were very happy to have been part of it. They used to have the old people's dinner at Christmas time, raise funds to get and go to feed all the old people who they, that were not able to help themselves, you know. She used to visit all the north. And of course, my father was very supportive. 
He spent all his time driving her to Marigold West, three vacas. He was always there assisting her. And even when the Queen visited, I think it was in 1975, she was awarded the MBE for her work that she had done in the community. I mean, she, they were, my parents are very community-minded. Very Let me community ask you a question. Well, just like you have all been, and let me ask this question. So your father, what was his job? Your mother was a housewife. What was your father's um, um, well, income source? Well, from what I understand, Derek can best tell you, but my father wanted to be an engineer. But since he was more, the, the, the first son, I think he eventually had to take over when his dad fell sick and had to take over the running of the estate. I remember him telling me he used to plant a hundred bananas, dig a hundred holes of bananas in terms of planting bananas. He would truck all his bananas to the geese, um, to, to the longhouse um, area. He was very, he, he had planted a lot of coconuts and all that. Derek can more, more um, expand on that. But something I need to tell you that because of he was doing copra and all that kind of thing. And imagine some years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, maybe more than 12 years ago, I was walking Roso and you know, this man comes up to me and he says, Miss Garraway, he didn't even know I was married. He said, I need to make a confession. So I said, why, why, who are you? He said, well, I'm from Portsmouth and I just came back from England to retire. I used to steal all your father's coconuts. I used to come back to him, sell him the coconuts. And never once he asked me where, where you get those coconuts, although he knew I was stealing it from him. <laughs> amazing, amazing. That's amazing. Well, what, I, what I'm going to propose, because the quality of your voice is so much clearer than that of Judith and uh, Derek, how far are you from them right now in way of distance? Are you in the same I'm area? Far. I'm in Springfield. Oh, you're in Springfield because I was going to say that um, if they're in the other room, they can just come and use your machine because you're very clear. <laughs> but, but, but Judith, Judith is quite clear when she sits up, you know, close to the speaker. Yes, she is. We'll we'll take a we'll take a knock at it. But let me just ask a few more questions of you before we go to Judith and Derek. Um, your father, where did he attend school, if you know, if you remember? Um, if I remember, I think he went to Harrison College in Barbados. Yeah. Was it common for the people from the better classes, the upper class, to send their kids to Barbados in those days? Well, that uh, Harrison College alone in those days tells you. <laughs> yes, because Harrison College, for those who do not know, is the most, in those days, was certainly the most um, uh, elite school in Barbados. It was the, uh, I think it was Harrison College and the Lodge School, but the Harrison College was the, the school uh, in Barbados. So he went to Harrison College. Was he the only member of your family who went there? Well, I, well in terms of him, I think so, yes. Yes. And, and um, can you tell me, you said he would be driving your mother around the north. Did he own an automobile? Oh, yes, he did. And you know what, Gabriel, he at that time was the only person with a vehicle in those days at the time. And, you know, people would call him from Capuchin. And, you know, in those days, you had the old phones where you used to ring, 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 ring. Yes. yes <laughs> and they yes. would call him from Capuchin Cottage everywhere to come and collect them, whether they were having a baby, whether they were sick and that kind of thing. And he too was the only notary public, JP, in his time. Yes. And he... Several people would call him to prepare their wills and that kind of thing. But he was a person, he never talked about what he did, but people yes. recognized him basically as a philanthropic. He, you know, he was always available to assist, you know? So he was a ju justice of the peace. He would notarize documents. He would yes. do wills. He would be a chauffeur because he was only the owner of a, of a, of a vehicle. Correct. And, and was his nickname, was his nickname Bob Garraway? Yes, correct. So let me tell you what my father told us of the early days of the war before he joined the army. He, Twist Bertrand, and Gone Emanuel would go to three homes to listen to the radio. That's right. They would go to R.B.D. Douglas, Bob Garraway, and a guy called Leonard Green. Oh, the yes. That's in his book. That he, said this, <laughs> he said these were the three people in Portsmouth who had a radio. He said that RBD Douglas, if you came into the parlor to listen, you had to pay a penny. But if you wanted to listen through the window, you could listen for free. 
And, um, <laughs> and he said to me that they remember listening to the Max Schmeling versus Joe Louis fight at Madison Square Garden, I believe, on the step of Bob Garraway. And that, that's an amazing thing. And how when Joe Louis and, and my father could narrate the fight as if he was in Madison Square Garden. You know, <laughs> he said to us, he's listening to the fight at your father's home. And, and uh, uh, Joe Louis comes out and a left and a right and a left and a right down. <laughs> a left and a right and a left and a right down. Left, right, left, right, down. And then he says to us, as if he was in Madison Square Garden, that people are coming in to pay their tickets to see the fight and people are leaving saying the fight's over. The fight's over. And you know, there was no television. This is just audio. But it was he, he gave us a vivid recollection. And then of course, the start of the war, he said there are two people who would be there either at your father's home or at RBD's home. And that was Dr. Amor, the father of the Amors. Right. Um, and um, also a guy by the name of Dewhurst, who he said was a white Englishman. Um, I'm sorry? That's right. He was a father of Desmond Dewhurst. And um, I met his daughter at the funeral in Canada in 2019 of Twist Bertrand. She okay. was there. He used to work at a bank. I'm uh, Anne or Karen? Karen? It was Desmond Dewey's sis, older sister. Uh, um, Corey. Corey. Yes, yes. She's who worked at the Royal Bank. Yes, I have to have a photo of her. And their mother, they lived on Libla Lane when I was a young one. Yeah, and I lived on Gideon Lane. Their mother's name was Indiana, my Indiana. Correct. That's right, Indiana. Yes. So, so, so your father had a radio. Tell me about the role of radio in your life before I go to Judith and Derek. Well, the thing is, in I mean, those days, and I didn't really listen to the radio because I like to read. I just spent a lot of my time reading and I'll never forget that, you know, my mother and father were talking once um, because they too spent a lot of time reading because we used to get papers every Saturday by the um, um, boat. You know, you used to have a boat run by um, Mr. Pemberton. He was the captain of that boat because we didn't have any um, connections by road yet. And so you're saying Roseau and Portsmouth was not connected by road. You had to take a boat to Portsmouth. Yes. So every Saturday, I used to go and collect the Tatler That's and true. the different magazines that were wrapped up. We used to wrap it up in a sort of um, khaki type cloth and send it up and get it back. So I used to be anxious to get those magazines because, you know, you had Tatler, Home and Gardens in those days, you know. And yes. I remember my mother and father talking about because the lady Chatterley's lover had just come out. Mm -hmm. And boy, I got that book and I spent a whole day in my room reading it. But when they're talking, they have no idea I've read it. You know, I'm listening. <laughs> 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 I'm just listening. I'm... Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> so in Portsmouth, did you have a library in Portsmouth? No, man. Everything you got from Rosa, we were members of the Rosa Library. And my mother's father used to get books all the time, send it back. You know, he had a little card stamp for getting yes. sent it back. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, compared to today, you, you, you can understand. And they accepted those things naturally. You know, it yes. was never an effort. It was just yeah. automatic for you to spend your time reading, getting what you had to get, making sure you got to the boat on time, making sure you collected it, standing up on a long line at the post office for mail every, every other day. You know, it was, you know, really something else. Before we go to uh, Judith and Derek, let me ask you one question about communal activities. Did you have a cinema or was there was there the uh, practice of showing movies in Portsmouth? Well, not when I was growing up, but yes. I know eventually my father used to go to Leonard Green's because they had this kind of role and this kind of film kind of thing on wheels or whatever it is when Derek can tell you more about that, but we didn't have a cinema. That's okay. why we had to occupy ourselves doing chores. Learning embroidery, doing crochet, doing tarting, doing chortan, typing, music, reading. You, this was the occupation. Nothing like internet or cinema or that kind of thing. You know, you had a completely different lifestyle. Now, Judith, and where, did you, and where did you live in Portsmouth? On Bay Street, Portsmouth. I see. Okay. And did you have a shop as well? My mother did, yes. We used to be selling in the shop. Away in a pong of floor, but uh, selling, we used to sell alcohol, we used to sell it by the shoot, a shoot yeah. of rum, a shoot. <laughs> My mother also sold shoes. 
you know, Listen. and yeah, so and ma measuring cloth by the yard, how many yards do you want, you know? That was so it was not just a shop for groceries, it was a general store. No, she had two, uh, she had a division. One side was the shop and the other side was the dry goods, like material and all that. Now, okay. now Derek can also tell you about my father in that he was known to be one of the strongest men in Dominica and what he did and why he was known to be that. You know, so he was he was he like a gym man, as they say then. Well, Derek can more tell you about that. He knows more okay. about it. But I know that once he was in a bad mood, everybody stayed far from him because he it won't slap alone. He'd send you on the other side. <laughs> so he was well built. Oh yes, yeah. Derek can tell you about that and do this. Okay, good. Well, let me let me um before I conclude, ask you about carnival. Was there carnival in Portsmouth in those days? Oh, yes, you used to have carnival in Portsmouth, Ban Mofe, and you used to be in the band. I, I used to be a great carnival lover. I used to yes. enjoy having my stick and going in the middle of the band pushing and <laughs> enjoying. <laughs> in those days, you didn't even realize the danger, but everybody yes. was in it at that time. Yes, you did know? you wear a mask? No, I didn't wear a mask, but a lot of people did because in those days, you're alone too, yes. you know? Okay, well, you know, Pat, this has been a great start to the interview and i'm going to go over now to derek and um judith um, yes if you can come a little closer to the microphone uh derek sure sure so derek a good good morning to you sir can you tell us when you were born and, and where were you born he needs to come closer to the mic yes you're born Bay Street, Portsmouth, what year? 31st of October, 1945. 21st of October. Derek, was it, without interrupting you, wasn't it the same day that your old grandfather died? The day before he died. Grandfather yes. died 1st of November. Amazing, amazing. And so Derek, uh, you know, first of all, thank you so much for sharing as uh, Pat has uh, sh shared. Tell us a little bit about growing up in, in Portsmouth, where you went to school and the sort of communal delights and, and what it is you did in your family's business. Okay, well, basically I went to uh, Portsmouth Government School, the same school as Father Jerry Judith. Those days that school was in um, where the credit union is now. And they have since moved to Ijika and it's called Rosie Douglas Primary School. Okay. After that, I went to grammar school, of course. But before so that, you, you went to the grammar school? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you had to take a boat to come to Roseau for that? Well, we went to Roseau like for the term and we came back only in the summertime. Eh? Yeah. Go to and did, you, was it, did the grammar school have a, a dormitory or did you live with family? No, no. We had to, we had to rent. We had to live in different places so we could get rent. You know? We didn't have, there was no job in grammar school. I see. I see. Basically, with friends. The girls stayed with one set of people, and Newton and I stayed with another set of people. So, how many of you at that time were at our grammar school? How many Garaway boys? Well, three. Well, my other, my first brother with my mother, he was more or less adopted by Newton Schilling for them. Okay. So, he was not really with us at all the time. But he was, he lived with Newton Schilling for the, at the, What was his name? Jim, Jim, Jim Gary, well, James Gary, actually. He was one of the original members of Swinging Stars like myself. Okay. And what what did he play? Guitar. And what about you? I played bongo drums, and Newton, my brother, played trumpet. So you had three brothers in the Swinging Stars? He started it in 1958. Amazing. Let me ask you a question, Derek. I was told, so I was a member of the cadet band, at the time of Major Earl Johnson, but I was told by, by um, I think, Norman later said to me that there, he thinks there was a cadet band in the 1950s. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. I never knew that. Tell me about that, if you can recall. I was a cadet in grammar school. Okay. I, I went to Barbados on training, six, six week training there in 63. But anyway, there, there was a little cadet band. Yes, not, nothing big. But then after, depending on the um, 
but it's not about music. So band, band, music, 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 music lovers, lovers band after that. But basically, there was a little cadet band, yes. Tell me what the instruments were of that little cadet band. Oh boy, drums, basically drums, eh? drums and um, I don't think there was any guitar. Eh? Did you all have fives? Did you have, have fives or flutes no, or no, bugles? Trumpet. There was one trumpet and, and drum, maybe drums and bongos and so No, No guitar, nothing like that. Okay, so this was a that was a marching band. That was a marching yeah, band. Band, yeah. So when the cadets would march through town, the band would be playing. <laughs> More or less, yes. Okay, and and how 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 high did you rise in the cadet movement? Were you a sergeant or something? I was a corporal. Okay, okay. Because uh, Dr. Clayton Shillingford and Dr. Dave Shillingford are, are very close to me, and they've said to me that your brother, your older brother Michael, was a cadet sergeant. Oh, well, I don't know about that. That's before my time. So Michael would have gone to the grammar school before you? Yes. Okay. And um, there's a gentleman in, in New York called Sims. Um, I can't remember his name. He's older than me by far. He said, he, Fred, sorry? Fred, Fred Sims. Fred Sims. Yes. He said that your older brother had a Vickers motorcycle. Is that correct? Possibly, yes. Yes. We, well, okay. he lived in the roads. He lived in the roads. Eh? Okay. Okay. Valley. Yes. So let me let me ask you a little bit about growing up in Portsmouth. Um, Pat said that you knew more about the farming and the agriculture than they did because I guess you're the guy working closest with your dad. Tell us about your involvement in agriculture and the shop and that that. Kind of thing. We had to. Well, we used to make copra at that time. Eh? A lot of copra. Copra. C O P R A. Copra. C O P R A. Copra. Yes. Yeah. And the reason that the the, the audio is so important is I intend to have this transcribed by a company. And oftentimes I interviewed a Dominican in Dominica who I wouldn't, uh, I'll tell you it was watch with others. And when they got it, they said foreign language. You couldn't understand what he was saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand what you're saying, but I want to make sure we have clarity so that, because you know, I, I'm not the one who's going to be typing it up. Okay. So your, your father made copra. He made copra and we used to ship that copra to Barbados. So Newton and myself, we had to go to the copper house, and you know, we had to cut the copper in little pieces for us to bag it. Because we used to, we used to bag the copper and then weigh it. Like every bag had to weigh a certain, I think it was 100 pounds. And just so for people who do not know, copper is the actual coconut kernel that's right. been smoked in a smokehouse. Right and it, uh, it then, of course, what you call concentrates the essential oil of the, of, of the fruit of the, of the coconut. And it, it's brown and it's very sweet, if I remember. Right. It's dried out in a, a copper dry. It's, a, it's an Indian dry. It's they brought the Dominican, I don't know, way back. Yes. Yeah. You, you, cut the, you cut the coconut and you put it face down, face down like in half. You know the coconut? Yes. Cut in half, you put it face down, and then you run a fire at the bottom. And you yes. have to run three fires for it to get properly dried. Three and fires? Three fires. Proper dry, yes. After that, you take it out, it comes out in big pieces, so you have to cut that so that it gets fit in the bag, and then you ram it, eh? you ram it, so you can get a hundred pounds out of it. Amazing. Then, then you ship that by boat. And the bags were made of jute, those are what you call crocus bags oh, in those days. Crocus bags, crocus bags, right. And we had a mortar pestle that used to ram it, a special mortar pestle. <laughs> For all the copper to fit properly, yeah. Yes. How big was copra in those days as a, as a, as a export? Very big, very big. That's our biggest export before bananas. I see. You know? Yeah. Bananas, and, and would people, who are the, who are the notable farmers in that period making copra as well? Amor, Douglas, Laville, you know, and um, I can't remember all the others. But oh, my God. And so you're talking about the Douglases, the Amors, and the Lavilles. Yeah. were big in the copra business. Right. And it was our biggest export before bananas. All right. Yeah. What other products did you have on the estate? Well, we had limes, we had mangoes, we had, uh, of course, bananas, citrus, citrus, you know, but on small amounts, and not, not as big as yeah. copra. We were basically a, a coconut estate, basically. That's, you know. But we had cocoa <laughs> also. Uh, but we had vanilla too. We used to dry vanilla and cocoa for making... Um, yeah, you know the cocoa that you make tea? Yes, cocoa, yes. Chocolate. Big, right. We saw the big trade and we had to 
dry it every day, put it out in the sun, and you have to keep turning it by to dry properly, you know, and then every night it comes. So, it. so Derek, let me let me understand, and this is very important. Despite the fact that you were more privileged than the average person, your father's a plantation owner, he had his own vehicle. You, as Judith, not Judith, um, Pater said, you were required to work, and it seems to me you're working very hard. Tell us about the work ethic. Oh boy, we had to look. My father made sure we had to plant our share of coconuts, you know. We had to plant so many coconuts on the day. I mean, they didn't get paid. Because he said, look, I'm sending you to school, I'm feeding you, that's the least thing you can do. <laughs> so, my so, so the fact that, so I'm trying to get this out because I think it's very important for young people to hear this. You're not sitting on the veranda shining brass and shining silver and drinking gin or rum, rum and tonic, <laughs> I mean rum and, rum and coke. No, I mean, no, no, you right. had to go out there in the sun and work like a, like a that's worker. That's correct. I had to carry coconuts on my head, you know, as a young boy. Like, just like the other people. Yes. Yeah. They say, my gasa, my smoke, gasa, my smoke, south of it. I said, no, no, my father wanted me to carry my nuts just like you. Yes. Yeah. So you'd carry coconuts, bags of coconuts in your head. Correct. No, yes, no, indeed. first of all, you have to collect the dry coconuts, eh? On yes. the ground. Before you bring it to the cup You understand? Yes. Yeah. Like the dry coconut on the ground, because the coconuts fall, and that's what you pick up to make the copper. Yes. So you pick up, you put it in bags, and you put it on your head, because in those days, there was no cars to go into there. No you There's no, like, you had no Toyota pickup, pick up, pick up trucks. Yeah. A donk, we had a donkey or one or two donkeys here, yeah, but basically, <laughs> the donkey can't take everything, eh? So, so today, how many donkeys do we have walking around Rosal? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of two-legged donkeys, a lot of two-legged donkeys. But we have yes. no donkeys on the estate, actually, so that's, that's the one. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so, and so, let me ask you, because for those who do not know, the dry coconut still has the husk. So right. would you be involved in removing the husk as well? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So you have to mask it and then put it in a bag and carry it. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Understand? So when you carried it, were you carrying just the nut or had the yes. husk been taken off already? The husk taken off. Just the nut. Yes, yes. 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 And how would you remove the husk, Derek? With a pickaxe, you have a special tool like a pickaxe. Mm -hmm. You right. hit it on the thing and it breaks. You have to try not to break anything. Yeah, yeah you, you have to try not to break the shell. Right. So you try. So you hit it on the on the spike like a spike. And you peel it off. And you peel it off. Right. Amazing, amazing. Now let me ask you about you know social life in Portsmouth. After you've worked on the farm, gathered nuts, worked with your dad, um, tell me what else would you know? Uh, Pat talks about reading a lot. That she enjoyed reading. Ladies chatted his lover and other things, the Chronicle and so on. But what would you do for your own sort of socialization as a young man in Portsmouth? Well, first of all, we had a gym. We actually made a gym. Eh? My brother and I, a few other people, were, 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 were. So we made a we made a gym out of lead. We melted the lead to make the weights, you know, from batteries. So we made our weights, <laughs> and they had different. Um, so listen, listen, hold on. You're saying you made your own gym. Yes. And were you importing weights from the England or the United States, or you made your own weights? I made our own weights from lead. You made your own weights from lead. How would you do that? Well, you take the battery and you take out the, the lead in it and you melt it. Amazing. You make a special container so you can, it can be round, you know. And of course, you have to put it in a pipe so they have a little hole because it has to fit on a bar. Eh? But then you have to yes. wait, make sure it's 10 pounds or 20 pounds, you know. Amazing. Yeah. That was quite innovative. I've yeah, never heard that before. Because we couldn't afford to get weights from those days. We have this nice fly out of England and you know how that is expensive. So we had to do our own thing. Okay, besides that now, we used to spend a lot of time in the sea. Sometimes going fishing, sometimes going up the Indian River just to bathe and have fun and stuff like that. You know? Well, bicycle. Well, I had a bicycle. What about the What about the Fort Shirley? Would you go to the Fort Shirley, which yeah. was at the uh, oh, on the yeah. Brits from Monterey? Go there at night to get crabs, actually. Sometimes at night time. Like yeah, to get crabs because well, for some reason that Shirley has a lot of crabs. I don't know. They come to Fort Shirley with crabs. So at night time, sometimes they're not all the time. We to go up and collect crabs. You see? 
And of course, the Fort Shirley wasn't built up like it, like Lenox did. You know, it was all ruins. It was all ruins. I remember going there myself as a youngster, getting cut, little grip shot, little grip shot, you know, the wrong metal balls, you know? Right. Yes, yes. Tell, tell us about any organizations that you belong to in Portsmouth. Well, I was a scout. I belonged to um, Harold Thomas was the scout captain in the Mexican. My brother was a scout too. So we belong to that. And uh, when we had a well, not me. My brother formed a band after for the techniques combo. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Did you did you also have a band in Portsmouth? Yes, yes. What was the name of the band? Techniques combo. That, my brother started that band, they're not me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Techniques combo. Any any members of the band that you remember? Yes, man. Um Jerome Joseph. Neil Joseph. Yeah, Jerome, Jerome. Oh, Neil, 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 Neil Joseph. I think Gerald played something too. Neil Joseph and then there's um Hillier. Yeah. Hillier, what again? What's his last name? Yeah, I can't remember his last name. Uh, Hillier. Hillier. Then there's um well, who the hell was there again? My brother was a trumpeter and he played the keyboard too. I wasn't around at the time. I was a sailor at that time. Eh? I actually So you became a sailor, Derek. I became a sailor on a, on a banana boat. But how did that happen? Tell us about that. How oh, did that happen? Yes. Well, I <laughs> I wanted to get out of Portsmouth eh? after high school, after grammar school. There was nothing to do there. So, so how long did you did you go from first form to sixth form, or first so form I, to fifth form? Fifth form. I, I dropped out after fifth form. Okay. But did you did you hear about Sunday Island? Did you hear anything about? Yes, that? I heard about Sunday Island. It was a project for the cabrits on the Libla. Right, but I woke up. No, Patrick John. Patrick John, not Lee Blanc. Patrick John. Patrick John. After after Lee Blanc, just after Lee Blanc. But, okay. Um, yeah, so I worked with um, Bruce Robinson. He was the one who actually organized the team, Sunday Island. And, and blah, 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 blah. Was Sunday Island a hotel project? Partly, yes. It, had, it had included a resort for the coverage, which included a hotel. A but they never started, they never broke ground, did they? Never started. A marina and all this thing. He had a big, big plan. It was a very good idea, actually. And actually, so I was supposed to be recruited to go and study about Hoover crafts in England. I see. But then we were recruiting, basically, and I spent my, how many months just recruiting for that Sunday Island project. Francis Avenue was one of them two parts. We just, we were recruiting people, we recruited by over a thousand people there. Eh? Oh wow! A lot, a lot of them were, were illiterate, of course. They, they couldn't, they could only sign with an X. You know, they were those unskilled people. But anyways, we still had to recruit them. So the plan was to have those people work on the project. Right. Whoever was suitable, like, of course, they would screen them eventually. You know, semi-skilled, unskilled, whatever. But that project never got off the ground. So uh, eventually, Bruce Robinson just he left. He left the Omega. He, had, he also had a poetry farm at Sylvania, too. I don't know if you know that. Who, who did? Bruce Robinson. He was, he was called I Mr. see. Mr. Poole. Yeah. So, so, so let me, so you, so, so how did you become a sailor? Okay. Well, I told my father, I'm tired of this person. I, have to, I want to get out of here. You know, right? So he said, well, maybe you can get a job on one of the banana boats. I said, okay. So I went to, um, was it one of the times? There was Clem Johnson, there was Randolph Mitchell, all these other books at Longhouse. So I, I went to them and they told me, well, when the boat comes, you can just go on the boat, they allow you to cross, but they will not allow everybody to go on the boat. Eh? They will allow you to go on the boat and find out if there are any jobs. So I said, so done. Boat came in, I went on board. And yeah, they told me they need a guy for the deck. I said, okay. I went home, told my daddy, I took my clothes, and that was it. That's how I <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Hand, how old were you? How old were you at the time, uh, Derek? I was uh, 18, going on 19, something like that. And and uh, someone who remembers you from that time said you were very well built. Yes, we saw, of course, we used to, we used to, we used to live west, you know. You forget we had a gym. Yes. <laughs> and my brother was Mr. Dominica at one time, you know. Newton. What's his name? Newton Garrett. The first Mr. Dominica. Clayton. 
Newton, Newton, Newton. Newton. Now return to our sins. Yes. Okay. He, so Newton was the first Mr. Dominica. Right. Yeah. So they had a weightlifting competition then. Of course. Weightlift, yeah, yeah. Weightlifting and, and, and body, like body building, basically. Cinema, Caribbean cinema. Yeah. That was 1966, I think. 66. 1966. I, I still have his cup at home there. Amazing. You must take a picture of the cup and send to Mima. Yeah. But we have a, Judith should have a picture of him as Mr. Dominica. But it wouldn't have the name and the, 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 um, the date on it. But I'd like to get a copy of that picture because that's amazing. I remember vaguely that we had a gym in, in um, Pound, right where the financial center is. My brother used to go there, deceased Dr. Christian used to go there. Um, and I know that in Carnival, that there used to be bands of gym men, they would grease, they would grease themselves, yeah. shining. And yeah. they, they would go through the Carnival, you know, with little skirts on, leather skirts, and show off their, their, their muscle. Was, was, were you part of that? Before, when I was in grammar school, we used to go to Charles' gym there, opposite where First Caribbean Bank is there now. What's his name? Charles Pat, Charles, Charles there. Um, Charles. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm thinking, Mr. Um, oh, no, 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 he used to live at Goodwill. Oh, this Charles. He had a gym right where you see the mapping building, is there? Okay. Below at the bottom was a gym. That's why we started going to the gym. Okay. So while you were at the grammar school, you were gymming as well? Right, that's right. Okay, so you, you, so when you got on the banana boat, you were, much, you were, yeah. you were well built and all that? Of course. Yeah, man, I was in top shape. You're, so tell me a little bit about your experiences as a as a sailor on the banana boat. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, by the way, uh, D Derek, you're talking about Giz Industries. That was the Giz, that was the Giz boat. Well, actually, it was a German boat hired by Giz eh? because Giz at the time didn't have enough boats, so they would take on a, a company called W Bruns from Hamburg, Germany. W Bruns and Company. W Bruns, B U B R U N S. R U N S. B R U N S. Hamburg was their port, Hamburg, Germany. So, okay. anyway, so I got a job on that day. It was called um, Bruns, Bruns Hall. Bruns Hall, that was the first boat I worked on. Bruns Hall. Okay. Okay. So, our first port of call was Barry, South Wales. You know, Barry, South Wales. Was that in the winter or was that in the summer? Winter. I got uh, April, um, April 1965 was my started working on that boat. So we arrived there just at the ending of winter, boy. I tell you, first time I saw snow. It was interesting. Anyway, so I, I even told the, 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 boss, the bosun that he didn't even have to pay me, you know. I could do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Just because of the just because of the experience and the yeah. excitement. I guess how much I got? Twelve pounds a month. Twelve pounds. Twelve pounds. Yeah. Was that big money? That's good, but it's all money said because they feed you like you just close everything on that boat. So just but you know, twelve pounds of in those days was still not enough money, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. So then after we used to go to um, Preston. Preston. That was another port. We used to go to Dublin, Ireland, too. Then we used to do dry dock in Liverpool, England. Okay. After a year, we had to go for dry dock. You know, they had to stay about three, four days. So, so all that time, Derek, I mean, while you're on the boat and so on, uh, you're meeting people from other places. Any memorable persons you met? Any memorable ports that you visited? Well, you see, they used to hire a lot of West Indians for, menial, for the menial jobs, eh? like working in the in the cafeteria, serving in the, in the restaurant, working on the deck, you know, menial jobs. The, 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 the more important jobs were the, the Germans had those jobs. You understand? Yes. Right. So, um, and, it was, uh, it was a and, and, and what, what, what was the sort of uh, um, fare for morning, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner? What, what were you served? Oh boy, that, that's one thing they had a lot of food. Eh? Like breakfast, you can have four eggs if you want it for breakfast. But of course, I would eat four eggs, I would eat two. But um, a lot of food, a lot of food. There's no lacking of food. Lunch, you have what they call a, a munch lack, which is like it's a mixture of rice and meat. And I mean, you know, the Germans, they eat a lot, eh? Yes. 
Yes. And, and you, you, you had your own cabin, uh, or you, you bunked yeah, with somebody I saw, else? I saw a cabin, and I uh, shared a cabin with another West Indian guy. Okay. Yeah. And how long were you a sailor for? Uh, five years. Five years. Yeah. Okay. Five years. And how long were you a sailor for? About two and a half years. I'm De I'm Derek, did you have to climb the mast at all when you're lower in the uh, yes, overseas? Well, yeah, no, you only, you only did that at import. You wouldn't be able to climb the mast at all. You when you import, we do the painting, you know, like places that you could like outside of the boat, you can go outside and you paint because you can't do that at sea. And Derek, at this point in time, I think it's very important uh, for me to note, and, and you and Judith and, and, and uh, Kat could speak to that, because one of the concerns that, that, uh, that those of us in the academy have is the lack of industry in Dominica. And as a child, I remember going to Portsmouth, when my father was in charge of fire station there, and there, were, there was boat building at the end of the uh, Indian River. I saw people building big boats, 40-foot uh, boat, 50-foot boat. Tell us about boat building in Portsmouth as you knew it. That was a big thing there. That was a big thing. Boat. I'm sorry, my father had a boat you know, during the war. You know that, eh? He no, I, I didn't. Tell me, what was the name of his boat? The Relief. A two-master. Relief was the name. And he used to carry... Relief one. as in R-E-L-I-E-F. R-E-L-I-E-F. Relief. And he used to carry drums of oil and gas from Trinidad to Dominica. But that boat had Amazing. no... Had no engine, I only sailed. And actually, that boat encountered a storm one time during the war, like I think it's 1942 or so, 43, somewhere there. And that boat went adrift for six weeks. And the fellas were all, almost were into a mutiny on the boat. So um, one guy, I met one guy after, a long time after, he was a chef. He was only about 19 years old, but he was a chef on the boat. You heard them saying that if we don't say anything, we're going to have to kill somebody because we're going to have to eat this The chef, because you're a young, tough fella. <laughs> so, so, you know, in law school, Derek, just so I don't remember the case, but there was a case where some fishermen went to drift and they uh, ran out of food and they sacrificed the youngest among them and ate him, you know. Well, and when they were rescued, they were charged for murder. Yeah. But they, they escaped uh, the death penalty under the doctrine of necessity, right. that uh, it was necessary to survive. So there was no malice and aforethought, you right. know. So so, so the guy said that they were going to they were going to they were going to eat him. Of course, and when he heard them over because they're talking patois, eh? when he heard them, what he did was he told me he went to the bow of the ship and he took a cutlass that he had there and he waited there and he couldn't fall asleep eh? because they would have come after him. Yeah, so finally a British warship found them drifting close to Bermuda and then that's how they were captured and then they had to sink that relief. And then my father had to put up that whole crew for three months in Bermuda. So they sunk the ship? This because it was full of um, diesel and oil and they didn't want the U-boats to get it. Okay. The British sunk it. And they took the crew and they put them up in uh, Bermuda for three months, that my father told me. He had to pay for them. I guess he had some insurance. Amazing. Yeah. That was 1940, during the war, middle of the war. Yes, yes, of course. And during that time, we had a lot of U-boat activity around Dominica right. and the other islands. Right. So that was one experience. Anyway, so, so that's how your father lost his boat. That's how he lost his boat. And he built that boat, well, not himself alone, but he with other people I feel that I have a picture of him standing seated, standing by his boat in Porsche like this. That same boat? Same boat. Can I get a copy of that picture? Yes, I will take a picture. And, and, and yeah, all you can do is use your phone and just take a picture of the picture and just send it to me. You just give us your email, your finger. Your, your, yeah, right. yeah. So after, so, so, so Derek, um, It'd be good to, you know, so the, the camera is not facing you, you know, I'd like to get it to face you. Is there any way you can? That's better. Yes. Absolutely. After after you left the um, sailing business, what did you do? Okay. Then I, I went to study aeronautics in New York in 1969. Yeah. I went to Peterborough School of Aeronautics. What was the name of the school? Peterborough. School of Aeronautics in New Jersey. Oh, you spelled tomorrow. 
T E T E R B O R O. T E T E R. No B P P P E R B O B O R O. Peterborough, Peterborough, New Jersey. Oh, okay, Peterborough Aviation Academy. He raised a T eh, as in Thomas. Yeah, Peterborough. No, no, no. T T Peterborough. T as in oh, Thomas. Oh, Peterborough. Peterborough. T as in Tom. Peterborough. Yeah, Peterborough. That was in New Jersey, and then after that, I went to the New York College of Aeronautics in New York, in, in Queens. I actually, it's um, flushing. Were you were you were you um studying ground school as in um, airframe and power plant maintenance, or were you studying um, flight school? Airframe and power plant. Sorry. Airframe and power plant. Yes. Yeah, airframe and power plant. Right. I got my license and I got an associate's. And then after that, I stayed in New York about six years between you know, studying and working. Then I came back home for about uh, almost a year to see if I know what I'm going to do. Then, right, then I migrated to Canada after that in 1976. And then I migrated to Canada. And uh, what did you do in Canada? Oh, well, I work. With, I work with a lot of aviation companies. I work with Bombardier. Then I work with Pratt and Whitney aircraft. Amazing. Yeah, I got married. And those are well-known aviation companies. Yeah, I got married in Canada too. Huh? And I had three children. What's your wife's name and your kids' name? Marilyn Jupini was my wife. Marilyn Jupini. Jupini, yeah, she's from Dominica. That's that's the uh, Dupini family from Dominica. Correct. Right. Yeah. So she's the sister of Jackie Dupini? First cousin. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And Jackie I had, and I went to six form together. Right. And then I had two children, two girls and a boy. Yeah. What's their names? Marissa is the first girl. Charlene is the second girl. And Russell is the sister boy. Marissa, Charlene, and Russell. Very good. So when did you return to Dominica? 1994. Actually, before I returned to Dominica, I went back to school to study hotel management for two years. Okay. <laughs> I got a certificate in hotel management, and then I came back in 94, after the hotel was built. Yes. What, what, what influenced the building of the hotel, the Garaway Hotel? Well, we had to... We, we had, uh, my sisters were given that property there on the basement when the hotel is built. Twin sisters. Twin sisters. By my father. He will that to them. So we figured yeah. we have to do something. We have to do something if you're right in the middle of town there. Yeah. And it would be a good thing, a good business um, enterprise if we could do something. So we thought of many things. First we thought of uh, apartment, apartments. You know, and, yeah. Apartments at first and offices. Then we did some research to figure out hotel would be the best place to go, so we went with that direction. And the government that they are. Judy can tell you more. That's I can tell you more. Part two. So, yeah, that's how the hotel came yeah, about. Yeah. We started the hotel, what, 1991? 93. Exactly. Yeah, but Berlin started in 92. Yeah, but it's all No, that's not when it started. I, I, just, I just want to say that um, I'm very proud of the work you've done with the building. It's a very nice building. It, in fact, enhanced the uh, frontage of the city of Roseau. And it's um, my hope that um, through our efforts at networking, we can boost the fortunes of the hotel. So uh, uh, Derek, what I'll do is I'll ask you now to um, put uh, Sister Judith before the microphone, and then we'll come back and do a wrong robin, get into more recent, uh, current times. That's correct. You know, no, uh, you're going to come on the blistering cross examination. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, Judy. First of all, Judy, I want to thank you for your service because, I mean, all of you have served in various ways uh, Pat, yourself, Derek, your father and mother, and so on. But I remember you my earliest memories of you. I think I remember you as a girl guide, you know. You're a girl guide, am I right? Definitely. That's right. So tell us about when you were born and where you were born, and then we'll get into the rest of it. Okay. So I was born in Dominica, 
born on the 27th of June 1948. I was the first of the twins to come out. <laughs> now in those days, that's twin, but you were not there to witness it. You were just told us. That's, that's what you call hearsay evidence. But you said 28th, 28th, 28th of June. 23rd, 23. Or 23rd of June. So, so Dr. Armour was the family doctor, right? You hear me? Yeah, Dr. Armour was the family doctor. Right, and he was the one who did all the home deliveries because we are all born in that house in Portland on Bay Street. Yes. So, I was born, he said to my mother, Phil, you know, she he calls her by his her nickname of pet name, Phil, I think there's another one in there, you know. Because in those days, you have no, no way of knowing whether you're having twins. Or <laughs> so, so there's nothing about sonogram or anything like that. Nothing like that. So my twin no, sister, man. So my twin sister Kathleen was born a few minutes after, right? Yeah, where's Kathleen, by the way? She's a nurse. She's okay, a because I don't think I know her. No. So anyway, so two of us, that was Judith and Catherine. Now, I was named, my name Judith, comes from the Bible. I don't know if you know the story of Judith in the Bible, where she beheaded this, this the Old Testament, yes. She beheaded this man to save her, her nation. I just ah. have a story with Judith. And then Catherine, my sister, her name came from Ireland, Irish. You know, Kathleen Marverine. My mother loved those old time songs and so on. Yes. And, and Kathleen is it a K or C? K, K, Kathleen. Okay. So anyway, my mother said two of us were the ones who gave her least trouble because we used to play with each other in our crib. You know? Yes. And, and whenever we would finish our bottles, we just take it and throw it outside the crib. <laughs> <laughs> but we kept each other company, so we were really no trouble at all. So yes, indeed. That's how we were born. Yes, yeah, so you, you attended the Portsmouth uh, Government School as well? Portsmouth Government School at ZCAC, right? We'd walk yes. up to school, walk up and down, you know, back and forth. And in those days, of course, school was whole day. Yes. So we went to that school until we went, came up the road to go to the West High School. Yes. So what I have to tell you is that my mother was one of the original students of the West High School. Okay. Right? And then, because in those days the, there was this big, I would say, antagonism or animosity between Roman Catholics and Anglican. You know, if you're Protestant, you couldn't go to convents. So they were very discriminatory in those days. So we we, we actually have to go to Wesley High School because we were Protestants. Okay, and Wesley High School was looked, looked down upon as a, an inferior school compared to convent. Yes. Convent, come here, Salops. Welcome here, Salops. <laughs> <laughs> so say, say that again because I missed that. Convent High School, what? Come here, Salops. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and West High School? Well, welcome here, Salops. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who do not understand the French Creole, Salop means a woman of uh, easy virtue. That's right. And yes. the academy was SMA, smell my ass. <laughs> <laughs> the school was God's greatest society. You don't remember that? No, what we say now is S DGS, damn good school, SMA, smartest men around. Well, um, the dog's greatest society was a grammar school, and the so academy was smell my ass. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So the, the meanings change you by the time you got to school. Yes. Yeah. Dog's greatest society yes. and uh, convent high school. That's amazing. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, and they welcome. Used to, they used to frown on us, you know, at West High School and so on. Anyway, that was, those were the days. So we went to West High School because um, of the Protestant thing. And then, of course, after fifth form, I had to go to, to sixth form, and convent was the only school which had a sixth form. Yes. So when did you enter the um, Wesley High School? What year? 1960. 1960. Okay. You were not that time. Yes. So then from there, I went to convent to sixth form, and I had to sign an agreement, agree to do religion, you know, and in those days, 
they used to study the papal encyclical, Matthias Magistra. I have to, I have to agree to do, you know, to study all these things because I was not a Roman Catholic. Yes. So that was a condition of my being accepted and six home in the convent. Yes. Anyway, so I spent those years at the convent, and from there, I, when I left school, I went back to teach at West High School for two years, right? Okay. And then I got a scholarship to go to Cave Hill. You got a scholarship to go to the Cavill, and that's the University yes. of the West Indies. Yes, yes, that was in 1970. 1970. So what did what did, again? You know, we are not having the best audio quality, and I'm I'm hoping that won't be a problem for the transcription, transcribing, um, because you said you went to. The University of the West Indies, UWE, but yes. I didn't hear what it is you went to study. Languages, French, Spanish. Languages. Yes. French and Spanish. Yes, and linguistics. Okay. And how long did you stay there? Three years. What was life like in Barbados? Man, it was like going to an extended high school. I was very disappointed with the university that it had because KB was a relatively new campus. I right? see. And they hadn't built the house of residence yet. They were in the process of building the house of residence with the help of Canada. So yes. It, so it was um, a Canadian funded thing. So we, we were the first students to, to live on campus. Yes. That, that was when they built the house of residence. And in those days, remember, Rosie Douglas was fighting his battle with Canada. Yes, and that's Rosie Douglas who had, um, led the uprising at Sir George William that's University right. in Canada in 69. Right, we went on hunger strike on campus. We burned the Canadian flag. We went on hunger strike. We, we marched to um, Bridgetown, Barbados, protesting. You know, so that was really a, a very active. We were very radical in those days. Yes. Not like today, the students do nothing. You know? So that was 70, 71, 72, 73. Okay. So I came back to Dominica and I went to teach at the Portsmouth Secondary School. Came back in 73. Yes. So PSS had just opened up, I think. It was opened a year or two before that. Yes. It was a whole set of us, young people who came back, you know, young graduates came back. Aslin Douglas, Tony Lockett, Arundel Thomas, a whole set of us, Ewart Lee Blanc. All of us were young graduates and we decided we were going to teach in Portsmouth because in those days nobody wanted to go to Portsmouth. Yes. Portsmouth was considered the back of beyond, you know, back of the woods. Yes. People look down on you, you know, even when we came to live in Rosa, they used to look down on themselves and so we come from the country, country bookies, and go out and some sun. Yes, yes. That sentiment was more, was very prevalent when I was a child, yes. Definitely, definitely. So yes, anyway, yes. it was early a revolution for us to go to the in Portsmouth. So I spent yes. six years there. But I don't know if Pat and Derek told you about the, the, um, the, the um, way of how was built on the land it was built on. It was built on. No, no, tell me about that. Right, no, it was my father sold the land to the government at a dollar square foot. No, it was 25, 25 cents a square foot. 25 cents a square foot, right? To build that school, that secondary school. And he never charged them for how many hundred coconut trees? 700, 700 coconut trees. Right, 700 coconut trees that he lost, he never charged them for. And the rationale for that, he said, he had to pay so much money to send his children to school in Roseau that people in the North would not have been able to afford to pay for their children to go to school. So that was his contribution, right? To make That's an amazing story that deserves recognition on its own. So I'd like to get a picture of your father or your family Yes. and do an article just on that subject alone because that's something that's very um, commendable and remarkable and I never and did nobody, that story before. Nobody talks about it. When they call you this and that and the other, you do nothing. Well, a lot of what Irvin and I have sought to do 
is to make a record of our history. Because, you know, if nobody does it, if nobody takes the time to do it, it will never be known, you know? So I want to do, before anything else, just on that, because this is the most, I've heard a lot of remarkable things this morning, but that is the most remarkable and socially um, commendable thing that I've heard, because it speaks to leadership, it speaks to civic virtue, it speaks to charity and, and philanthropy, and it speaks to a high-mindedness that he would take the time to sell and take, I mean, make the sacrifice, because land is expensive, to sell the land for 25 cents a square foot. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Have to come close now. My grandfather, Sir Robert Frederick Galloway, he donated the land for the hospital and the Anglican Church. Free. And cemetery. He didn't charge them a cent. And that was Robert Frederick Galloway. Yes, our grandfather. So you have to. Let me. Let me. Let me make a note of that. He donated the land for the Portsmouth Hospital. And the Anglican Church. And cemetery, and cemetery. But all that was part of the estate. Yeah? And he was also a lay preacher at the church too. Yeah? And he was a magistrate, yeah? a magistrate yeah? So that's Robert Perry. So that's important for people to know that. Um, um, if I may add, it's always, it's also important. Um, um, Gabriel, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I that, can. That even the tenants on the estate, my father um, allowed them to pay a peppercorn rent. A lot of them, even some family of well known lawyers now, they couldn't, they, he never charged them as he would a normal situation. And even to today, you have people paying $100 a year for the, the land that they're utilizing and they live on. Even today. Even today. $100 EC. Yeah. You're collecting that rent, by the way. So you still have some land in Portsmouth that has been rented? Yes. Yeah. Where well, they live. In fact, their mothers and fathers and grandfathers live there. Now their children are living there. For $100 EC a year. So the Garway estate is in the town of Portsmouth or on the outskirts? Oh, on the outskirts, I would call it. The connection is adjoined to town. Yeah, it's, it stops in the town, in the town, but it extends outward. Do you know how many acres? Yeah, 289, but now it's 286. Okay. So, so, so not only were you involved in agriculture, as Derek has mentioned, but your father, and I think this is very important for a variety of reasons, because that is something that we have to consider as an island, the boat building business. He built his own boat, the relief. Right. And and you're saying, and, and um, you can chime in, um, Pat, if you have memories of that, that boat building, in fact, was the most one of the most important industries in Portsmouth. Am I right? Yeah. That's the only way you could get to Dominica anyway. You know, now we have the alliance, but and, and 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 Derek, maybe you need to tell him about when the storm was approaching and daddy put the boat on his back and brought it on the show. Well, that, not, not that boat, a small light boat. Yeah, but still he did it. And in fact, he had to have an operation for all his veins in his back of his... He almost killed him because he, was so, he felt he was so strong. He didn't need help. So he just lifted the boat. He had no help. It almost reminds me of Samson and the right? That's right. Okay, small boat into safe, safe harbor. Yeah. No, on the, on, the, on the shore. You have to bring it ashore. Yeah. Well, it's in safe harbor. Safe harbor. Did you all have any interaction as children with the many yachts? Because I have found oh, records yeah. oh, that yes. um, oh, a yes. lot of the yachts, you know, would come down. Tell us about that. I can give you a, a story, if you don't mind. My, my aunt was married to my uncle. Father's brother, right? He was Clifford Garrow, okay? He was a businessman yeah. and so on. So his father, Robert Frederick, was collecting stamps. 
I was in Hong. <clears throat> and he had stamps all the way back since Henry VIII or before that. Right? Yes. Okay. So this lady, her name was Jessie Frederick. Frederick from Bakers, married my uncle. Rupert Sarandos. Rupert Sarandos family. And his aunt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he had a store right there by Borough Square in Portsmouth, right? So a lot of the young fellas used to come there to, for drinking. You know, when they anchored out, they'd come ashore and have drinks and stuff. So she heard one guy talking, said, oh, he's collect stamps and so on and so on. So she overheard him saying, oh, well, I have stamps, you know. I have stamps, you know. You want to buy my stamps? He said, sure, sure. A British guy, eh? by the way. So she brought the stamps to him and she sold it for 300 pounds. 300 pounds? We don't tell him my father nothing. My, my, guess my, I don't know if my uncle was still alive. I'm not even sure, but he may have been still alive. But he himself didn't care. So imagine he collected those stamps from way back, eh? Those things were yes. thousands of pounds. Yes. And of course, I don't think my father would have wanted to sell those things. He wanted to keep that, but she sold it. Wow. And those are stamps that were like 100 years old. Well, more than that. From, I tell you from Henry VIII. Amazing. And, yeah. So that's just one yeah. story I, I remember to tell. Would you all as children go uh, about the arts, uh, be invited about the arts for dinner? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. We used to get a lot of German stories, right? And purple turtle especially. Yeah. We used to go and, and have dinners and really nice time on those yachts, man. These people would come ashore and I mean, it was really a good experience, you know, in those days it was safe. And you know, we really used to we used enjoy- to swim to the yachts. Yeah, you know? swim to the yachts and they would have nice dinners. And I mean, it was really nice. We used to yeah. swim to the yachts. In, in in fact, in fact, um, I met um when, when they had permitted the original owners. I remember them well, and um, I met made friends with the um, daughter, and um, it was Mary Kay. In those days, I didn't even know that what Mary Kay was, and they gave me a necklace and an earring. To this day, I still have it. It's never turned black. It's as though it's gold. So, so the people who owned Purple Turtle originally were Americans. Then? Yeah, uh -huh. Brian. It was I can't remember his name, but um, O'Brien. I wanted two of them, two different gentlemen, and one had a daughter, a young girl, and I was her age. And we, because I tell you, we used to practically live live on the beach, you know. From the time we finished, what we do not we on the beach. Yes, that's where we, where we were morning on a night. In fact, I remember one day. Newton went out because Newton was a person who was like a daredevil. He had no fright in him. Anything, he's ready for a storm. And he used to go out on the Sundays. He, had, he used to go to school, nurse. We used to go out with him on the boat. We used to turn over the boat, swim under the boat, turn back the boat. All that's happening outside, you know. I mean, <laughs> now they have sharks. I ain't going out, but it's amazing how we didn't think of those things then. And one day Newton was left. And when he, he came back, he came back in Monday morning. So I remember my mother said, Newton, where were you? He said, I was in um, the Saints. My mother You're didn't kidding me. So he left there. and went to the Saints. Yeah, and then he came back next day. For those who do not know, that's the French territory of yeah. the Saints. And in those days, she, she, was, she didn't worry. She didn't say anything. I mean, she just said, Newton, where were you? <laughs> so what kind of boat was that that he had? A sailboat? They had sailboats, and I remember George Carr used to have a speedboat, and they used to come to Angus Edwards. They used to yes. be on those boats and all out everywhere. I mean, you know, Newton is a person, boy, I tell you, you are something else. Yes, yes. Where is Newton now? He lives in Miami. Okay, what, what, what does he do? He's well, he's a retired, um, he's a retired, um, what they call it, Levi executive. In fact, when he left, he used to work with Geese Industries for a long time after he left yeah. grammar school. And then he went to New York and he graduated Cuma Cum Laude and um, he really went into this um, business. But, you know, he was the only person at this time that passed physics A-level at grammar school. Amazing. So he ended up with the Levi Jeans. very good at maths and all that. Okay, so he ended up with the Levi Jeans company? Yeah, and he was a, a executive. He retired uh, in some time ago, and he, he he used to live in Wisconsin, and then he moved for, to retire in my in Miami. 
Fort Lauderdale. Amazing. Lakewood. You know, when I entered grammar school in 72, uh, two of my close friends, well, my closest friend was Mark Frampton, and then Mark Frampton, Freddie Mondesi, Peter Gary and Michael Gary and David Amo, they had a club of uh, flight, they call the Fly Boys. They had little planes. Um, they were tethered, but they were motorized planes. They would go to the gardens and they would fly the planes. I would go with them. Yeah. My brother, the vet, Wellsworth, who treated your Alsatian, I'll never forget. I want to digress. One Sunday afternoon, <laughs> either you or Judith or both of you came with an Alsatian dog to our house in DJ Lane. My brother just got back from India, where he had studied veterinary surgery. And someone had slashed the dog on his mouth. And we set up a table and Wells for the first time I saw a, an animal being given saline solution. I was holding the bag of saline solution into the vein of the dog and Wells put the dog to sleep with anesthesia and was suturing the dog. Was that your dog, Pat, or was that your dog, Judith? I had an, I know I had an Alsatian, so it could have been my dog. I don't think Judith had an Alsatian. But you yes. know, we were always brought up with dogs. So, yes. <laughs> yes. So someone, I think, had uh, slashed the dog with a cutlass. It and could have been, you know, I don't even recall, but I know. Um, that would have been like 1981. It could have been because Julius Samson gave me that Alsatian when he was leaving right after the Hurricane David. He left in 79. So yes. it could have been, yes. Yes. I'm not sure whether the dog survived because it was a very grievous injury. Yeah, it did because it's, I, it was up here with me when we moved. We moved here in 80. Yes. <laughs> so that's amazing. So well, Zip must have done a very good job, man. <laughs> yes, uh -huh, because he lived until he got, um, what I said, these this, um, pedigrees tend to get everything. But we yes. used to have mongrels in Portsmouth and we didn't know what it was for them to get sick, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. The mongrels are very hardy. But but let's get back to the whole idea of um, Newton. So yes. Newton ended up at Levi Jeans Company. And was he related? So let me ask this. Who was the, who was the father then of Peter Gary and Michael Gary? That's Alec. Alec. Or oh, half-brother. Daddy, you're talking about the the, our nephews, because there's two Michaels, you know. Okay. My father's first three boys with his first wife. Yes. Right? That is um, Alec, Tony, and Michael. Alec is the father of Peter and Michael. And Isla okay. and Elena. He had four children. Then Michael, Gary is the father of Levi and Island Doris. And then Tony yes. is the father of Bohemian. I don't remember the name of his children. Yes. yes, Robert and so on. But, but so you have two Michaels in the family. Michael, the, the, my, my brother, and Michael, my nephew. Yes, yes. My nephew is the son of Alec, who was married to Aunt Jules, and they live in Nassau. Well, both of them are dead now. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I had a big case, one of the first cases in Maryland, where a foreign father was allowed to take his U.S. children overseas. We won the custody case. Wow. And the, the people were very well-to-do Bahamians. And wow. they invited me to Bahamas for, on five occasions. And I finally went in 2018 or 2019. And I met Michael and Peter. They had not seen Michael and Peter in 40 years. Wow. And we went to dinner and so on. Yes, man, because they had left grammar school when I was like in second or third form. And they'd gone to the Bahamas, yes. you know? So, you know, the last time I met them, we were like, you know, 12, 13, you know? Yes. And uh, of course, they're all now grown and so on. So it was nice, you know? So, yes. so we keep in touch now because I have their information now. Yes. And, and um, I just also want to say about Michael, how I got to know about Michael. Uh -huh. Sam had a practice in Ohio, a surgical practice. And his son, Kwame, attended Ohio State University, both undergrad and law school. So one year we went to Ohio, we drove to Ohio for Thanksgiving. And he said, come to the campus, let me show you around my campus. So I'm driving, he's driving, I'm passenger, and I'm looking and I see this building and it says, this building is, is dedicated to Mark L. Garraway. Right. So I went into my phone or whatever and I, I Googled 
And I found out that Michael Gary was from Dominica. That's right. That's Michael Gary's uncle. That is your, your Michael Gary. I mean, That's you know, right. And then, of course, what happened was, fast forward, my father passes away. I come home for the funeral. Judith, you play the organ. Right. And on the Sunday, they asked Purcell and his daughter, Leanne, to come and play the violin. And as I'm, when we when we finished, we're leaving. I saw Pat, and another lady, and she says, "That's my that's my sister-in-law. Her husband was Michael Garraway, yeah. Anne Marie. So yeah. I have been communicating with Anne Marie. In fact, I intend to, if she's up to it, do an interview with her. And yeah. she told me about her your relatives, Levi, and his sister, both of whom are very distinguished yeah, cancer surgeons. Yes, yes, yes. Tell me about that." But um, Judith, you haven't finished about the school in Portsmouth. The school in Portsmouth. Yeah, because Judith wrote the school song. Judith wrote the school song. Well, tell us about the PSS school song, Judith, because are you able to write, read and write music? Well, I guess you can read music because I saw you reading music. <laughs> So tell me about your tell me about your background in music, Julie. <laughs> so anyway, my, my mother was a musician. Yeah, my mommy taught all of yeah. us to, to, to play the piano, right? She was a musician. She taught piano lessons. She took piano lessons as well. Very different for some levels. Anyway, so I learned to play the piano, and then when I came to Roseau, I learned to play the organ. You know who taught me to play the organ? Tyler Stringer Christian. Amazing. Tyler Stringer Christian and myself was friends who were at school together, West High School. Oh boy. And then she was, of course, you know, all of them were really accomplished musicians. Yes, yes of course. Really young, but she, was, she was excellent on the organ, so she taught me, I used to understudy her. I met, I'll send you a picture I should have of Palestrina. I met her in 19 for the 100th birthday of my aunt, Ruby wow. Christian, who was also English, I mean, a music teacher in Glasgow, Scotland. And she died at 101 in 2020. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so I met Palestrina there. Because when Palestrina left Omnica, I was a child, you know, I didn't remember her too much. Okay. I met her just twice before that. Once when she came in 69. And I think another time she came visited after Hurricane David with her family. So I hadn't seen her in a long time. Yeah, so she taught me, my dear, to play the organ. Amazing. After I took over playing the organ. And do you know before that my mother was the church organist, and before her, my aunt, my father's sister was the church organist, and my my father's sister, was of all in Gary, was also the church organist. Amazing. So you have a history of church organists from the Gary family. And my mother tells me, she told us a story about her becoming the church organist. She said when they had to be interviewed. As to you know, selecting an organist, she was both herself and Mrs. Bascom. You remember Rita Bascom, Carol Bascom's mother? Yes. So both herself and Mrs. Bascom were the two people who have been interviewed to play the organ. And she was selected, right, over Mrs. Bascom. And Mrs. Bascom only took over the church organist's um, job when she, my mother, got married to my father and went to live in Portsmouth. Yes. Right? So my mother got married and went to live in Portsmouth in 19, whatever year she got married to my father. 1941. And at that time, my aunt, my brother, my father's sister was the church organist in Portsmouth. Right? So Clara was organist. Clara was organist in Rosal. That's one of my father's sisters who died very young. 49. Anyway, my dear, so to go back to PSS. So when we, we, we became teachers, we were teachers of PSS, you and me, and myself, Tony Lockett, Aplin Douglas, Ariel Thomas, even that guy, Rabbit, Greg Rabbit, became later. A whole set of young people. There was a core of young graduates there. So it just, people are very motivated, you know, they were excited. You know who I taught for six years, five years? All these people are now the, the posse mafia, you know. Ali Clarence, Leonard Florence, oh, Levi, Levi oh, Peter, Reginald Austri. The whole gang I taught at PSS, you know, from first Ross, class, Ross, Ross. Paramount, well, Ross was younger. So they will all tell you that they owe, they owe me. Because somebody even asked me, did you teach them ethics? 
No, um, I think you should. I think you should. Uh, you know, I, I, I instruct you not to answer that question. <laughs> or to. Uh, <laughs> that's, right. that's 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 no that's true that's true i mean you know uh, it was almost commonplace to hear things like your parents would say it there was something called the student companion that we had in those days oh yeah you say things like honesty is the best policy waste not want not i wish i want to get one from katrina so that that book that book was a very important book in our lives and so you really didn't need much lecturing you know who was our English teacher in our school? Mr. S. J. Lewis. Oh boy. Who's our teacher like that anymore? And students come from another library, you know. We learned everything from that man. We don't teach that anymore. Tell me, tell me what you thought, you know, and that, any one of you can answer, all of you can answer. How important was the student companion to your formative um, characteristics? Yes, yes. ago I was telling Tony I want to get one so I was checking in Jay's but I need one for my grandchildren you cannot it's do it funny. That it's funny you said that Pat I went to door I came to door almost 20 years ago um, after, after I came out of law school well it was more than 20 years and because I came out in 91 and I went to the bookstore it was frontline frontline was still here and I bought a and copy then, yes. I bought a copy well I was the first president of frontline you know of, uh, and, and Eddie Tula was oh, the really? general manager Yes, I mean, that's why I came down to help bury Eddie. I mean, I was devastated when Eddie died because he and I, I have letters upstairs of Eddie too long. Men don't write men, women write men. But Eddie yes. write me letters because we're trying to make Frontline a sort of progressive bookstore with progressive books on Africa and different things. And we kept a close relationship. His sister and I still correspond. I send her, no one again, if I come across a letter, I take a picture of the letter and I send it to his sister, you know? And yes. um, so I went to Frontline to buy a copy of the student companion. So I have a copy here. Yeah, definitely. You know, because it was um, that sort of foundational piece of um, literature that was, um, as you said, a reference book for almost everything, you know? Yes. I, I, you're saying, Judith? Yeah, going back to PSS now. So he was back. PSS. Did you? Right? And I said, we decided, look, we need to have a school song. And uh, the crest and everything. So Ewan Lipner designed the school crest. You know the crest you put on your uniform? Yes. I can't remember what the motto was. But anyway, I wrote the school song, right? Students walked with um, marching hand in hand together, build their fatherland, and so on, forward on PSS. So let me give you a little joke about that. So some years ago, when I was in DHT and I was put place affiliated with NBC, it wasn't DDA, Discover Dominic Authority. They asked me to go and do a series of presentations and stories at different schools. So Portland Senior School was one of them. So when I got to Portland Senior School, that was possible. So I started my presentation and so I said to them, Hello. I said to them, Do you all know this school song? Oh, you pass, you pass, I said, Do you know this school song? I said, um, let me hear you all sing it. And they said, I'm dragging it. So I told them, no, 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 that's not how it's supposed to be sung. And I started singing it for them. I said, it's all like La Marseille, the French national anthem. You know who wrote it? No. Do you know who designed your school press? No. So I said, well, you know, I am the one who wrote the song and the music. And he was Libner, Mr. Libner's son, who is a teacher, was the one who designed the crest. 
Well, they didn't have a clue. I, yeah. Well, that's the thing. So at the grammar school in those days, we had the clarion. Yes. At the SME, they had the Marian messenger, messenger. And yes. the sixth form, we had the um, civil call courier. Right. So we, we wrote, right? So a lot of what Irving and I do today, we started back then. So the schools today, they do not invest much in magazines, either online or whatever. And so absent the written word, I always tell people, we know about the Egyptians because they left the hieroglyphics on the walls of the temples and the tombs of the pharaohs. We know about the Greeks because of Herodotus and Plato and Aristotle because they wrote. And yes. unless we get into the practice of well, writing history, and of having our history, yes. you know, Churchill said something, and I always recall it. Churchill said, of course, I didn't hear him say it. He, he, read, he, he wrote it down. He says, history will be kind to me because I will write it. Exactly. Uh, and, um, yeah. So that was PSS, eh? and I mean, PSS was a very vibrant school in those days. And as I told you, all these young fellows, Ali Gorn, they taught them from first form to fifth form, right? So, you know, it, in fact, when I, they used, to, um, they used to call their other nickname for me, because I used to teach them French. So sometimes I would, well, not something, anytime I went to the classroom and speak French and say, Bonjour, mes élèves, and they say, Bonjour, mademoiselle. And up to now, when Lennox Lawrence, Ross Laramore, all of them meet me, they say, Mes élèves, they have a nickname for me, they call me. <laughs> so they will tell you that I thought all of these fellows is buggers. Yes. You know? So it's amazing how they have now evolved into others, but I really don't know. But well, that, I, I, I must say that you can lay the foundation and you can pray that the foundation will be solid. But there are other factors, you know, I mean, you are in the house, you guide your kids a particular way. But when they go outside the house, they meet different friends exactly. right? they meet, and they, they can then take their own path, you know. And so, I mean, the fact is, you can be you can be you can you can be, you can be rest. You can rest assured that you did the right thing in helping with the school song. And um, that just gave me an, an idea, I think. Um, Arundel Thomas is still around. You're still around. Yes, yes. I had Iwat Dibla here at my house. I interviewed Iwat here. I will send you the interview I did with Iwat here at this house. Um, he, his, his daughter is a, is a lawyer in Washington now. And he just, he just became a grandfather. And so he, he was visiting her. And I, I, I didn't know Iwat. I knew his brother Einstein. But I didn't know Iwat because Iwat was ahead of me in school. But I got to know him because he would... We, I helped Irving write the book on his father, and he and Irving are relatives. I think he, they're first cousins. And so that's how I got to know him. And I interviewed him. So it's important for us to make the record. It's yes. very important. And I'm hoping that we can wrap up now to talk about almost your, well, um, Derek has told us about his education in New York. Um, you went to UE, but I know you didn't stop there because later on you became an attorney. So tell us about your legal education. No, 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 no. My husband was the attorney, not me. I was I'm sorry? I'm, I'm not an oh. attorney. Oh, you know, you know, you know, Judith, I swear, I, I know you are in the diplomatic corps. In fact, you are best ambassador as far as I'm concerned. Yes. But I almost always thought you'd gone on to law school, you know. No, I didn't. I'll tell you, I went on to do a master's in tourism planning and management. But before I go there, let me tell you something about the PSS and the coconuts. So, because I live with my mother in Port North, you know, I was everything because all of us did our things in Port North. And we uh, boy, the, 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 the audio is poor. The audio is poor because oh, no. I'm can straining hear, to hear you. You can hear me better now? Yes. yes. Okay, so what happened? Because I lived in Port with my mother for six years while I was there, we are the only two at Mongolia where we live, you know? And we'd have to, I'd have to do all the chores, like, you know, as Derek said, he had to plant coconut and um, banana. And I didn't do that, but we used to have milk, you know, from cows. My father had some Brahman bulls or Brahman cows. Yes. And we used to sell milk and things like that. And we used to sell all kinds of things, mangoes, and we'd have to deliver those things. And then I'd have to go to the copper house to help to peel the, take out the, 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 the the, the hair from the coconut, the husk, not the husk, the the the, the, the fiber, fiber, fiber from, the from the shell before they break it and put it in the fire to yeah. cook. So, what so Judith, you're telling me you're doing all that kind of working class work, man? 
That's right. After school, you know, after teaching from eight to one. So hear yeah, that? You have heard the joke yet? So one day I'm in the Cobra House. Now that is the Cobra House is on the way to PSS. You know, we remember PSS is on the estate, right? Yes. And the Cobra House is on the other side. And the door is open, and I'm peeling peanuts. And a little child is passing, a little student, a young girl, and she says to me, "Miss, you peeling coconut?" <laughs> <laughs> I told her, but how you mean that? That is what sent me to school. So I'm telling her, why you don't come and help me and make some pocket change? You know, the child told me, my father didn't send me to school to peel coconut. And that was the end. Wow, 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 wow. And you know, and that that is a very important statement you've made because a lot of times yes. um, people were of the view, the old prejudiced view that if you went to high school, that the days of hard labor were That's over. Right. And right. when I was a teacher at the grammar school before I came to the States, so after I left sixth form, I taught at grammar school from 79 after Hurricane David to 82 for about yeah. three years. Before I went to school at eight o'clock, I used to run up to stock farm where we had cattle uh -huh. to, to feed the cattle, exactly. to take care of the cattle. Exactly. I'll have to come back to Didi Lynn where we had pigs and put food for the pigs get a bath, yeah. iron my clothes, go to grammar school. Oh, In the evening, before the sun went down, I had to go back up to stock farm right. to get glory cedar and zeb oh, and so on that's for that's the cattle. At right. that time, L-Rose was still running, L-Rose and company, and the cattle ate the lime peel, the squeezed lime peel. Yes. So I'd go to L-Rose, put bags of lime in the back of the car, bring it up to stock farm, feed the pigs. Colin, Colin McIntyre, at that time was working in agriculture. There's a huge piggery at Stock Farm. And when I was done with my work, I'm not a government employee for agriculture, I mean education. I would help Colin, who Wells of later taught when he came back from India. I would hold the legs of the pigs while Colin castrated the pigs. So I know Colin very well, you know? And so I had no fear. When I came to the States, I worked as a janitor. Right. I had 80 boats in the Potomac River. I worked on the old presidential yacht, Sequoia. I worked on Donald Trump's boat. Right. I met Donald Trump when I was in college. Wow. Taking out trash. Yes. Here am I, I am a grammar school teacher, but yes. I was taking out trash. A duck steward is like a janitor. You tie the boats up, you maintain a logbook, you check the water, the electric, because these boats, people live on them all through the year. They work at the Pentagon. They work at uh, NASA, they're well-to-do, but they live on your yachts. And I would be the one cleaning up. And I used to be concerned that in the warm weather, I would be there minus 20 degrees, the river is frozen over, and look at me, the scarf, and I want the dogs walking up and down. And in the summer, I was concerned that somebody from school would see me. I used to have a big cart with two big bicycle <laughs> wheels. Yes. You know, like the rickshaw that the Chinese used to pull yes. with a big hook? I'd be pulling this big trash can, hip high with bags. And I'd say, boy, I just hope no one of the girls from class see me down there. Say, look at Christian, you know, but that's, when you, when you go through the crucible of working as a youngster, like you and Derek and Pat, it makes it easy for you to do anything. Exactly, and we are brought up to do everything. Nothing my yeah. mother taught us to do everything. And she always said to us, make sure whatever you do, you're independent. Right? Yeah. Don't have to depend on nobody for anything. Yeah. So, that was the yeah. so anyway, they were asking about my subsequent training and so on. So I, after I taught at PSS, I realized, my God, this thing, I'm not going anywhere in terms of career, mobility and so on. And uh, what made me decide to give up the teaching at PSS? One year, when school reopened, when we got to the staff room, we had no equipment, no registers, no chalk, no chairs in the staff room. So some of us decided we're going to go on strike. Okay? Now, Bill Robinson was the PS education at the time. Remember Belgrave Robinson? Belgrave, yeah. My, my wife is a Robinson. My wife is a Robinson. That's, okay. that's her uncle. Yeah. So yeah. Belgrave Robinson was the PS. So it was John Laron, Athlete, myself, who else? We went up to support to Amrozo. And we told him, look, we have no equipment. We cannot do our job. And I mean, so we're on strike. So he said, well, y'all won't get paid. So I told him, so we said, him, well, I told him, I will, it don't matter if I don't get paid, because I'm leaving the paper, so I must eat. <laughs> <laughs> so 
when you realize we are serious, you said, don't give them what they want. So before that, I have gone to England to do my... Look at Alina telling me the infection is still there, we. Eh? Anyway, so, anyway, so PGC, we went to, I went to England to do my postgraduate certificate, oh. right? Because I wanted to be qualified and trained as a teacher. Yeah. So oh. they, they said my own way, and I went to England for a year and I did my PGC. So I came back as a trained teacher. And here I did that with my, all my material, all my teaching, you know, um, material and so on. And here it is, you know, the government is not giving us basic equipment to do our job. So I said to myself, I said, no, 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 I'm not going to continue this thing. I spent my money to go and get training. Instead of helping me and rewarding me, you're telling me, you know, we will get paid. So I decided there and then I'm going to give up teaching and do something else. So that's how I went to study international relations. I see. I went to the and, and when, what year was that? That was 19, the year of the hurricane before independence. 79, 78. Yeah, 79, because independence I studied in Trinidad and the Cabo for that. So I went to Trinidad at the Institute of International Relations, and that's where I did the diploma, and then I came back and I was recruited to foreign affairs. Yes. And also to Oliver Seraphine because that was the time of the strike and the coup and all that. Well, not the coup. So I was with Oliver Seraphine and after Hurricane David, we went to, we were on a team going to, this, to the UN and all that. The Philip Nassif, it was Philip Nassif, Nick Liverpool, Colin Moody, myself, and OJ. We were the five man delegation we, who went to the States and, you know, to ask for. That's after Hurricane David. After taking all those antibiotics. Okay, um, so um, Pat has to mute the phone. Pat. Yeah, hello. With your antibiotics on your. You have to mute your phone. Whatever you say. Hello. So, 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 no, so I, was, Philip... I was looking. I was looking at a WhatsApp. I know. So Philip Nasi. You can take that Julie... out. Yeah, of, of course. Jul Philip Nassif, Julie Garway, OJ Seraphine. Dr. Nicholas Liverpool. I think it was Philip Nassif part of it now. I'm not sure. And Colin Bully. So that delegation was to seek assistance, really. I can't remember the details of that. But we went we did the massive group. All of the UN, Washington, State Department. I went to Canada too. Yes, went to Canada too. I think Philip Nassif was part of that delegation. Well, he studied in Canada at McGill, so that made sense. Yeah, I think he was part of the delegation. Anyway, so that's how I, I got into foreign affairs. And then, of course, the government changed Freedom Party came into office. And then Miss Charles became Prime Minister. I was a, I was the first female PS to be appointed eh, by government, by Miss Charles. Okay. And I was also, I became also the local correspondent for the La Francophonie. Okay. And Jean Jacques Cobras, you have to draw the technique in those days. And Dominican has lost that completely now. I don't think about it. So we. That was Alias Frances. No, no, not Alias Frances. Alias Frances is government, a French thing, right? I'm affiliated to the French government. But Jean Jacques Cobras, you have to draw the technique. Is a, it's like the equivalent of the English speaking commonwealth. Is it French? Oh, I see, yes, yes, yes. It's yes. A, and it's a, an uh, organization of all French speaking countries, which were formerly colonies of France. Yes. That all French were speaking Africa, French speaking West Africa, right? So we used to go to all those meetings in Paris and Senegal and Gabon and all those places, you know, as part of that delegation. Not that yes. delegation, but I was the chief correspondent for that because I was like the secretary for Dominic. Yes. So anyway, well, I, at this point in time, and I know we may have to come back, but I want to get a few things. Can you and Pat tell me, give me your, give me your, your recollections of Eugenia Charles and what kind of leadership uh, she abided that might be of relevance to us today? Pat, well, I can give you chapters of that. Because when her book was written by this girl, you didn't bury so. Remember? I know more the Higby book. I think I have Barry too as well. Yes. Joint power. You didn't bury to wrote that book. I, I have that, yes. 
And she asked me to do the introduction when she presented as Yui. I am the one who did the introduction uh -huh. of her. There will be pictures of you. And I'm telling you, we will never have another leader like that. Right, Miss Charles, let me tell you, everywhere we went, that lady was respected. And they saw, remember they saw it, Eugenia Charles country. And um, I mean, you didn't have to, even though where Dominica was, you just learned about Miss Charles. And people respected Dominica, they respected her. She stood for principle and everything. She was, Integrity. Yes. And she's, she, she, um, she was above board, you know, and she told you exactly where she stood, I mean, people thought she was a broke, but one thing, sometimes I think she, her shortcoming was that if people went and spoke to her about you, sometimes she would just take what you said, the person said. She had a tendency to not pass, investigate and find out what is the other side, right? So she would be a bit hasty, I think, in making judgments of people, because working with her, I could see the way she treated some people, because somebody might have whispered them in her ear. But when it came to me and professionalism, I had no problem with that. She never once asked me what party I belonged to. Even though party I suppose she knew, or party supported, or family of freedom I was on. But that never came up in the 15 years I spoke to her. I worked with her. She never yeah. once said, well, yeah. I'm not doing this. And you know, she always said to me, as PS, she said, first thing, she's going to be first thing. You do your job, I'll do my job. You have no responsibility to advise me, and even though I don't agree with you, at least you put it down in black and white, and if I'm wrong, well, you would have been vindicated. She used to tell me that, put it down in black and white, don't worry about her position, just advise her on what should be, what should obtain, and that is how we operate it. And yes, she indeed. A lot of confidence in me, she gave me a lot of opportunities to develop, right? And I, I mean, she never stood in my way, because even when I went to work with the Commonwealth, she had lost the, well, she had stepped down from politics by that time. And um, she gave me a very good reference. So did Edison James and so did Ron Lewis, who were three prime ministers that worked with. So from, from there, I went to Commonwealth. <laughs> so you, you worked for the Commonwealth in London for some time? For six years. Oh, okay. For six years. Yes, I was deputy director of the political affairs division. My boss was in Australia. And um, I spent six years there, and that was really interesting. I see. Well, yeah. I just want to thank you for your service. Yeah. Um, you know, I had the good fortune for 13 years while she was prime minister to uh, work uh, on uh, different development projects. The biggest book project we ever did was 10,000 books from the Baltimore Book Bank uh, that we were directed to do by Ms. Charles because she had that relationship through Partners of the Americas. Yeah. And that's how we yeah. got yeah. the books down. Yes, there are a lot of organizations that used to be there in the 1980s that are no longer as prominent. But you know, that's what that's what it was that working relationship that led to her being here in October of 1996, 10 days after our daughter was born, where I interviewed her right here in this room. Um, and I've sent some of the tapes to you, I believe, on YouTube. Yes, yes. 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 And uh, that's what led to the book. So my hope is that we can have something similar. So the next time. We will maybe get into some of the current issues with yes. governance and so on. But what I'd like to say is this. If you can tell me, and we'll do a wrong robin, Derek, yourself, and then Pat. And, and maybe I'll start with Pat. And then I'll go back to Derek, and then you can close it up, Judith. Yes. As Dominicans who went through the colonial period, early days of independence to the current time, what are the systems and the value principles that you thought made for success? And what are the, without necessarily naming names, what are the sort of mistakes that we're making as a civilization, as a society, that is causing for us to be plagued with issues of governance and crime and the like? And Pat, I'll start with you. Well, um, personally, I think that it's important to have civics taught in the schools because it's it's amazing that a lot I mean, many of the people are not even aware of their history and in terms of what is necessary to build up a society that um, emph the emphasis is on discipline, integrity, 
knowing what is wrong is wrong and what is right is right. There seems to be a norm that this just does not matter these days. And I think that based on the upbringing that I was fortunate to have had, my parents were very strict in terms of discipline, in terms of integrity, in terms of being honest. And it was not based on being materialistic. Okay, I was, when I was 23 years old, I knew that my father had properties in Roseau. I never do that. We went to school, we were bored, we paid board and lodge. We were at, in fact, I experienced not having electricity to study. I had to use a candle sometimes to study. I had no access to ice water. We didn't have any proper toilet facilities. We had found ourselves using pit latrines and that kind of thing. So, you know, these were not the things we were taught, taught that, yes, is going to, and even if we complain, we, our parents just say, you're there for a while, you make good use of it and move on. You never allowed it to sort of stop or, or interfere with what your objective was. You know, it, di it didn't, it, and then we had, we lived in a situation where we had all different types of friends living with us. One was from Atkinson, two were from Grand Bay, one was from somewhere else, and ourselves. I mean, I didn't know after a while, I didn't drink um, ice water, you know, Gabriel. It's only water from the top I drank because we had sometimes, a lot of times, no access to cold water. Amazing. You know, so it was a privilege upbringing to say that, but you were privileged in terms of knowing and having discipline integrity and what is good in terms of building up a proper um, uh, um, uh, uh, an individual who's going to appreciate in the long term the, yes. the, the finer things of life yes you know so yeah and, and what would if there's a message you could give to the young boys and girls of Dominica now based on the sort of hard work that you and Derek and Judith have related to me this evening that you had to do because people would say, oh, you know, the Garys, you know, they're bourgeois, you know, they're well-to-do. I didn't know that Derek would carry coconuts in his head and that Judith had to go ahead after, while she was a teacher, be doing the work where a young student is saying to her, miss, I didn't know you'd be peeling coconuts and so on. I mean, give us a message to the young boys and girls in Dominica who oftentimes, I believe, are too idle. Well, the thing is, what we, what we were taught has helped to mold us as the as the, um, with the, 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 whatever we've been able to achieve or to be the individuals that we have turned out to be, it's the hard work and the sacrifices to, to know that everything is important in terms of being self-sufficient. In fact, if, if we were not taught, we would never have been able to even maintain a staff and tell them, well, you know, you need to clean the room this way. You need to ensure the toilets are properly done. You need to ensure you look, look at the top to see their cobwebs in the ceiling, because this is, these are the things that we learned at our homes. That's how we were brought up. We, you know, we didn't go to a special school, you know, to know how to run a hotel. It is our skills and what we had been exposed to that helped to us to prepare for what we eventually had to undertake to survive. Yes, and as the owners of the of the Garaway Hotel, how important is it to have a hotel? Uh, infrastructure that's owned by local people. How important is that? Well, it's critical because even when we came to select the name, we said that we were going to use the name because that property was the first property registered in the registry. It was number one of 1820. Number one of 1820, first property that registered in the registry. Yeah. Oh yes, remember our great grandfather was the first black president. I'm very still as his sword, I think. Of the local legislature. Of the of the region, I think at that time. Because the the, the um the, they could tell you more of the history, perhaps should it? But I know that Lennox Ahani Church had mentioned it once. I didn't and what was his name? Uh, not James, not James Garrow. And uh, Derek, Derek would be able to tell you. Derek. Okay. James Garrow, yes. James Garrow. Okay. All right. Well, 
Pat, I want to thank you so much for your contribution. I'm going to go on to Derek now, and then I will close with Judith. Okay. Derek, if you can put yourself before the mic. See if you can bring Derek a little closer. So his face, I'd like to see his face. Yeah, yeah. You can see him now? Yeah, I can see you now. A little more to the, a little more to your left. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying, I think we were much better off in the colonial than now. A lot of, Dominica has regressed in my lifetime. I have seen a lot of regression and I don't think we are making any progress at all. Yes. A lot of factors, yes. a lot of people have migrated and there's no incentive, especially for the young people to return here, like my children. I don't think they will be coming back here in a hurry because there's no incentive. Yes, no incentive. You know, the young people I see here in Dominica, they have no job, they, they don't know what to do with themselves and they end up getting into crime and doing all kinds of things. So, I have not, I haven't got much um, faith in the system as it is now. I don't think it's going to do, it's going to get any better in the years to come. Okay? So, as far as I can see, there's much more, not much to be here for young people. Right? If I was a young person, I definitely would be here. You know? <laughs> That's the bottom line. Yes. Well, you know, um, Derek, what you're saying is very something that I have actually thought of writing an essay called Colonialism Reconsidered. And this is what I mean by that. It's not because I didn't think we should have independence and have our rights and all those things. I believe in all those things. But I think what we mistake, mistook rather, was that colonialism was just about slavery. That was only part of it. Colonialism was also about botanical sciences, education, healthcare, how you organize a government. And so our job in the anti-colonial, um, let's say, uh, movement was to take those things that, was, that were uh, productive and progressive and, and intelligent about the colonial enterprise, the botanic sciences. Look at the botanic gardens. Oh, the botanic example. gardens we have now is a shame a from what I knew. Yeah. Look at uh, the library, you know? Right. We, we, we had, uh, I, I came across a case. Cecilia Green did an a, a essay on a case that the British brought against a teacher in the 1930s. You know what the case was, Derek? The gentleman had a child out of wedlock and the authorities believed that as a teacher, as a principal, he should not be in that position if he did not set the example of rectitude and he lost his job today i mean you know people would laugh at you but the fact of the matter is those value systems that were discipline oriented that were structured that were productive were those systems and values we should have retained and then those things that were uh, negative we should be discarded but i think oftentimes what they did was we threw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, I, I have an, I remember in Barclays Bank. I don't know if you remember Joe Ilati. I do. He used to work in the bank and he was a cashier, right? Yeah. And you know, he had to quit his I job. think he was married to Belgrave's daughter, INT, no, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Bar 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 okay. Bar oh yes, okay, that's it. So Bar 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 his daughter. Yes. And I remember, I remember. He had to quit his job because he was just a cashier in the bank. He could not have afford a wife in the bank. So imagine. Because she was pregnant. Because she was pregnant. He had to quit his job because he was just a cashier. Amazing. And what do you see happening today in the banks? Eh? All about my bank It's a joke. So you yeah. see, we have lost all these um, colonial business, our brothers. Yeah, that's, that's, that's ethics. Oh, yeah. yeah. And respect and everything. That's all gone down the drain. I mean, yes. who, who, you, who would you look up to? I mean, from the top. No who, who do you look up to? You see this, this, this. No it's, role a, models. It's, a, it's a shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a very, very um, uh, 
sobering comment, a very sobering comment. I've, t- I've said it to my wife, it's something I, I will do, colonialism reconsidered, because when I was a child, we had much more productivity, we had much more organization, even with the cadet program that we revived when Rosie Douglas became prime minister, um, the cadet program is there, but they don't understand why, why we did it with the cadet program, because I was a cadet from age 11. And today, you know, I can say the cadet corps l- l- gave me a system. Of, in fact, I'll tell you what I'll send to you and Judith and um, Pat. In the middle of COVID, I organized a cadet reunion from a 1974 camp. We had a camp Londonderry that Major Earl Johnson was the director of. And Johnson is maybe in his 80s now, the commandant is in his 80s. And of course, the 11 and 12 and 13 year olds are now in their high 50s, 60s. And we did it on Zoom. And I'm gonna send it to you all this afternoon and you'll enjoy it. Because the Barbadians, one of them, the band leader was a guy called David Strawn. And he fell in love with a girl in Dominica and when he went back to Barbados, she introduced him to his friend, her friend, who was the daughter of Crispin Sorrento, and he married her. Wow. Unfortunately, she's passed away. So, so being cadets, you know, really shaped our lives. And uh, I, I, I want to ask you a few questions, Derek, about your time as a cadet. Okay, you know, we had gone to Barbados for six weeks training camp, eh? and I don't know if you know um, this guy Pablo. You know Pablo? De Chaussée. Yes, Richard Leta. Leta, Richard Leta. Richard Leta. Leta. Yeah, Leta, okay. At that time, he was a private. Okay. okay. And then Earl Johnson was in charge of the camp. He was the camp commander. And then he was, at that time, dating Pablo's, yeah, Pablo's sister. Yes. Jacqueline. So we went, yes. on, we went on a, a route march from the garrison Barbados. We had to go to Gun Hill. I don't know if you know Barbados. Not really. Anyway. So on that route march, Pablo fainted. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> what Earl Johnson did, he said for his bravery and all that, he's going to make him a corporal right away. <laughs> I never forget that. And we were not happy because Pablo was really, you know, fit. Uh, you know, imagine fainting. Yeah. So he made N- him name, a uh, Derek, name some of the people who are connected with you. Okay. Um, um, Julian Johnson. Um, Neville Edwards, um, um, Aline, um, Kenny. Kenny Aline, um, who else somebody, Ashwell Bas- Barkett, I don't know where he is now, um, I can't remember, I can't remember somebody right now, but I have a picture here, you know? can you take a picture of that picture and send to me, yeah, yeah, I can, I have to look yes. for it, you name, you name the guy after Kenny Aline, was that to say Ashwell Barkett, Ashwell Barkat, Barkat. I don't know where he is. No, he's Dominican, but I don't know where Mr. is now. Um, I can't remember all the other names. Comes up, you know. But Neville Edwards was there, of course. Um, Kenny Aline. Was it was it a Giro? Was it a Giro guy? No, 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 no Giro. And and in those days, what was your uniform? What was your uniform like? Well, we had a brown uniform. With short pants and a hose. That's what we were in those days. And you had potties and so on? Yes. That's what I did, did you have your did you have your Australian bush hat? No. We had just a little berry like. Okay. Berry. We didn't have what was the color of the berry? Was it brown or was it brown. red? Brown. Yeah. Brown. The whole uniform, whole uniform was brown. That fella that worked in the bus, I saw I see him there that I just see him. Matsuki, no, Matsuki was in there. A fella, he, he's, a, he's a religious fella. I can't remember. Anyway, no, no, no. I see. I saw him a few days ago. He's um, a religious fella. He has belongs to a church to me and whatever. He was, no, no. But look, when I see the picture, and I see the faces. I remember the people. You know, I, I, I have to look for that picture. Let me, let me, let me tell you this, Derek. There's a owner of a radio station called Q95 called Sheridan Gregoire. Yeah. Yes. He's, he said he was a cadet as well. Were you a cadet with him? I cannot remember. Sheridan was. I cannot remember if he was. But would you mind? Would you mind being on a program with all cadets? Yeah, no problem. Okay, because the reason I want to do that program is, and I'll call Sheridan today, is because a lot of our youngsters need to have a sense of direction and discipline and ethics. 
And um, it's amazing the amount of cadets who have gone on to do great things. I mean, um, Dave Schillingford, Clayton, Dr. Christian, Dr. Wurzel Christian, a lot of these guys. And I actually met a Dominican. I actually met a Dominican who became a general in the US Army. Are you aware of that? No, no. His name is Eddie Charles. He was an SMA cadet, then a grammar school cadet. Then he went to the Virgin Islands and joined the US Army and became a brigadier general. Wow, wow, that's good. So I'm gonna send you an interview I did with him on Zoom. And it's amazing. He was born in Pong, right where the financial center is. Okay, okay. You know? And he talks about how the cadet program shaped his life. So I want to just commend you for your service. Yeah. And I look forward to maybe cut, getting back to you on just the cadet program. But what is the most exciting thing about the cadet program? And how do you believe it really shaped your life? I think it, 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 it's taught you a lot of discipline. Eh? I remember one time in this cadet where we used to have this um, Queen's Parade at one time, Queen's Parade, right? Queen, Queen's Birthday Parade. Queen's Birthday Parade. And remember, I don't know if you remember Alan Bontin. Yes, I worked with Alan Bontin at Smith and Lord. Right. He was he was a cadet too, but he didn't. He was at most of the states. Anyway, so when we were in the gardens, the botanical gardens, Alan Bontin also fainted, you know, as a cadet. <laughs> he fainted in the botanical yeah. gardens. Oh, yes, you had to faint at attention, you know. Yes, he fainted. I never forget that. But then he joined the, uh, he went to the, joined, joined the American Army after that. Eh? I wrote got... an article on Alan at his death because in 1976, my mother got me a job at uh, Smith and Lord behind Witch Church. Right. And um, I was making battery acid and selling Land Rover parts and uh, parts for Johnson Outboard Motors and even run Outboard Motors for fishing boats. And we got a shipment of books from Rotary, US, Rotary USA. And Alan and I were unpacking the books. And he took out his shirt. And when he took out his shirt, I saw a lot of scars on his stomach. Alan had stepped on a mine or something yeah, he in Vietnam. Cool. And he said, Christian, come up to me and push my stomach in. And I pushed his stomach in and I could feel something like, um, like a mesh. And it was fiberglass. He had fiberglass to hold in his bowels. And later on, when I returned to Dominica, as you and um, Judith and Pat may not know, we returned to Dominica in 2003 and built our home. Sadly, we've had to sell our home because of the way things are in Dominica. The first time I had some money, I bought, I built my home, and then they broke into my home. Oh, what was your home? So I went to Allen. I went to Allen. He was still alive, and I bought a pistol from Allen. In fact, the pistol is at the police headquarters now. And um, the first thing I did was kill a snake that was coming by the house up in over over Belfast there, that's where we lived. And so um, then he died. I had a beer with him at um, Brizzy Mart. And then next thing you know, Carl Philip told me that he died. And so I, I will send you the article I wrote on Alan because he was a very um, civic minded guy and he got the bronze star. He got the bronze star for heroism in the Vietnam War. I believe he was a Marine. But yeah. you know, we used to have a saying, you know, when you used to go to grammar school, after that, don't pull an Alan, but don't pull an Alan Bunting on me. Huh? You know why? Yes. He would, he would be talking to you in normal Dominican English. Yes. Every time American passes by, he changed right away. You know, start talking American. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Why don't pull an Alan Bunting on me?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Alan Bunting, you know, you're right. Alan Bunting had the facility. I, because I, I, I heard him speak patois and so on. He yeah. would speak patois and those things. He could speak French Creole, you know, he could speak French Creole. But you're right, if certain people came to the store when I was there, like if like maybe a tourist came to the store, he would switch. That's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting an Alan Bunting on me, boy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He was like, a, I think from, I think your family was from Texas or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but that, that was very interesting. I and did you, all have your, did you have the range also, the shooting range at the back of the school? Um, yeah, we used to practice. Yeah, and also in Bunny and Barbados, we had a shooting thing there too. A shooting competition. Yes, yes indeed. I should be a, a good shot, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, well, the guy, the, Dominica in those days had the Dominica Rifle Club, I remember. The 303s. Three oh yes, the 303. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm going to send you a little. Um, I had my daughter interview me about the 74 camp. That's when I first shot the 303. And the 303 hit you there, man. It had a kick. 
a kick, you know, because we had our own rifles at grammar school. We had um, 0.22, which was very, very light, 0.22. But but the 303s would give you a very hard kick. Yeah. So my hands started sweating. The guy said, grab the gun. I had to grab the gun. I was shaking, man, because I was just about 13 years old, you know. But um, thank you so much again, Derek. And we'll put uh, Judith in front of the screen. And yeah. I'll ask a few concluding remarks. Make a few remarks. Thank you. Yeah, so when you are talking, you actually took the words out of my mouth. They throw the baby with the bathwater. Yes. Even though colonialism was something we wanted to get out of. But yes. there was a certain discipline and, you know, structure that was instrumental in shaping people's approach to everything, to how you behave, whether it's in public or private service, right? So you expect a certain standard. Right now, we have no standards. Anything yeah. goes, anything goes. And I think it's because you have to blind it in the blind because people are in positions where they really don't know what their job is or their role is. And yeah. I think when I was a civil servant, you know, you had, as I say, role models. You could look up to people in government like Miss Charles, I mean, me and Adam Brand to a certain extent, even Charles Sandberg, all these bad ways. You know, people stood for them and they were kept on track and you had the leadership who kept people on their toes. I mean, this is Charles, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, step sideways. You had to maintain a certain standard and you're held accountable. Now nobody's accountable. Anything goes. So I think we've lost that. And because people don't really know what, what the rules and regulations and they don't abide by any rules, nobody seems to be held accountable and nothing is transparent. You know, it's, it's, it's just square pegs in round holes and you cannot really learn from people who hold any positions of authority, you know, because they don't know what to do. They, they're lost. They themselves need guidance and education. I'll start talking about civics. I mean, I remember he talked about Ali Lawrence and his book. I have some copies of those things, you know. I have all his things, you know, on the civics and what he constitution and all that. I mean, those kind of things he he has powers and stood up for. But those things have gone. So it's a matter of convenience now. It's a matter of convenience. You do what is convenient. It's very selective. I, I want to share something with you that you do not know. I I, I brought out I brought out the book for a particular reason. Yeah. You know, a lot of our lives are shaped by the people we associate with. Definitely. So that was shortly after Ruzia died, and we created the Dominica Academy of Arts and Sciences, with people like Dave Schillingford and Clayton uh -huh. and Raglan. We're bringing all people together and trying to pattern our society and those societies that have succeeded. Because you cannot succeed as a society unless you are organized. Right. So Alec came to the symposium in New York. He brought he brought, at his own expense, to his credit, Scarrett, Roosevelt Scarrett was Minister of Education. He brought Vince Henderson, who was Minister of Agriculture, and he brought Emmanuel Nanton, who was at that time in government. And the whole idea was that we would work together. So Irving and I said to Alec, Alec, you know, you're a lawyer in Dominica. Why don't you write a book about the Constitution and civics and so on? Because there is no such book. Irving and I, by that time, we'd written about two or three books. So we, he said, well, boy, he doesn't, you know, know how to get that done. He said, okay, we'll just write it. We will edit it. We will publish it. We'll get it printed. All right. So that's how that book. So if you notice the book, it's a Pontcasse Press production. Pontcasse Press is the same company that Irvin and I set up in 1992 to do our first book. Now, once the book was done, our hope was that they would use that book in the schools. That's right. It and never that's, happened. That's the end of that. So, you know, because remember, right after that, then we parted ways because we saw the way things were going. Right. We saw the way things were going. We saw that guys were not interested in the academy. They were not interested in Dominicans coming back, not to vote. No. We didn't want, we would never encourage Dominicans to come back to vote. We wanted Dominicans to come back home, build their homes, work in the schools as volunteers, build businesses, exactly. bring their income wherever they had been, their retirement income or whatever, their skill sets to help replenish right. the pool. That was what we wanted to do. And we still intend to do it. Because as you can see, the challenge we have, as your brother Derek mentioned, and Pat, and you're going to talk about value systems, value engineering, 
tell us how important that was for you, for your success, and leave us a message to the young boys and girls. But that is the basis of anything. If you have to achieve anything, you cannot take shortcuts and think that by, you know, doing something different, if it's, it's not what is required, if you're not accountable, you cannot achieve things. Go to catch up with you as they talk about karma. Good or bad karma will get you in the end. So you cannot really do something without following the rules and because you're, you're upsetting the whole apple cart because people get confused. Right? The young generation right now are confused because they don't really know what is right, what is wrong, because everything has been turned upside down. You know? So what you are brought up learning to your children, you know, they tell you, work hard at school, be honest in your dealings with people, and uh, what is good will come to you and so on. That, is, that does not pain anymore. It's, it's just the opposite now. If you steal, you get rich, you know, you lie, you get rich, you know, you get thrown, you get promoted. So it's the people who are doing the opposite now who seem to be succeeding. So I think the young generation are confused and they, they have scared it as the only person they know in the last 20 years. My God, how the hell is anybody else going to counteract that? Because you're going against what people think is the norm. The norm is no, is now abnormal, right? The norm is no longer ab um, the norm, it's abnormal now. And I'll give you a story about me and my campaign. We haven't talked about politics yet, and me as leader of Freedom Party. So we're, gonna have, we're gonna have to do a separate, and we're gonna, gonna make sure that you're at, at Pat's home with Pat's machine, because Pat is the one that has clarity. But, but go I'll ahead. Give you, I'll give you that anecdote, right? When I was leader of Freedom Party, and we had the campaign for the election, we went to a village, Grand Fond, as they're talking to his farm, talking to So when I got there, a pack of women came to me, you know, and they said, boy, Mrs. Preston, you pretty man. You have a nice nose. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's, but, that's real Dominican talk. But, but you're looking so ugly on TV. So oh, said, God. I said, well, you know, TV makes you look bigger. It makes you look different and so on. And Roman guy must be tired and so on. Anyway, and in December, they said to me, what do you bring first? <laughs> I said, you know, and they said to me, well, you know, you must come with your green clinic, you know, because we have to come with the red clinic. Yes, yes, so yes. I said, yes. you know something? You know that I brought for you what I stand for. I'm talking about the issues. And first of all, I cannot cheat, I don't bribe, I can't steal, and I can't promise you what I can't give you. So if you don't believe in me for those things, don't vote for me. And that's just what they did. We all yes. lost our deposit, and that was the end of Freedom Party in election. So I, I'm telling you, so those th what people are looking for is what's in it for me. It's nothing yes. about country and long-term development and so on. It's the short term. You know, people are cutting in those who spread their face. And yes. people like you and me who stand for something, we are the enemy. Yes, yes, we indeed. Yes, indeed. So I don't know how this thing is going to turn around. Yes, but well, look, you know, um, faith, 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 it's an uphill struggle, but faith Enjoy it forever. I believe in the triumph of good over evil. I think it was Dr. King who says, the arc of justice, the arc, the arc of life or something is long, but it bends towards freedom. And so I do believe that, you know, long though it may be, if we stick with our value systems, our principles of success, of integrity, ultimately we will succeed. Because, because um, as we can see, you know, I mean, even with the Ukraine situation, which is a terrible situation, um, I was saying to my sister this morning, um, a lot, a lot of the problem that we see is again greed. You know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, uh, what's his name, Putin and these guys, they grabbed a lot, they grabbed, and they became oligarchs. They stole a lot of money, and they went to England, they went to the states, they came here in Washington, they ended up in Dominica with yachts and so on. Now, where is all that now? That's right. We'll catch up with them eventually. Indeed. So, you know, I, I, I have no fear because I know that the ownership, just a question I asked, so how important is the ownership of local physical plant like hotels to nation state development? What are your thoughts? Well, you see, the thing is ownership depending on who owns, because for us as indigenous hotel owners, right? I mean, you invest as a Dominican hoping to, you know, you create a plan because in long term, the whole 
um, objective was to create employment, not only for ourselves, but for Dominicans and to develop the country, give people an opportunity which they would not have had, right? But at the same time, you cannot do that if you don't develop a work ethic and ethics generally, because even the people you get working in your business, if they don't have that kind of ethic, they themselves cannot, they're not productive and they just sit on their whatever, hoping to get paid for and you know, fear days work for fear days pay. That doesn't exist anymore. That's how you're brought up. Okay? So you, even though you, you're trying to develop something, the people who you expect to to um, perform, if they don't, they're not on the same path, on the same wavelength with you, you're hitting your head against a wall. It's like hitting your head against a wall because you're talking a different language, right? So it's important that they themselves, you teach them and hopefully they learn, or, but a lot of them, don't. they're not in it for what, you know, they, they, they're just there for what they can get a salary at the end of the day, but the, the kind of competence and excellent, you know, standards of that. To me, those things have to be taught and learned and so on. But, and people have to emulate that. But they, to me, Dominicans now don't want to emulate what is good, right? They're not interested in performing at those certain standards. They're very, they're very mediocre. They're satisfied with very little, right? And not that they've been reduced to this dependency thing, begging, scared, begging. They don't seem to want to work. I think a lot of them have become lazy, right? That's why they criticize the Haitians and so come in and taking their job. But that's not it. The Haitians have a need. They're working, they're working. But you're criticizing them because they're working harder than you. What are Dominicans doing? So you see, that whole thing has to be reintroduced. People must learn to work. They must develop a work ethic. They must be honest. They must be accountable because right now you don't have to be accountable for anything you get by by doing just the opposite of what you're supposed to do and if you yeah. try to discipline them they hate you for it they demonize you and yeah. it's just like politics like they demonize me in politics because i'm judith Pestina, i'm a bourgeois and so on. people so many people don't oh, judith that don't look like you because i was talking the language they used to the mepuisant and they're not talking about issues. Look at Lennox, what they're doing to Lennox. Yeah. Right? The same thing. They try to undermine the whole leadership because he's showing them up. And what he's showing them up, they, they cannot meet those standards. So they have to resort to that demonization and so on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's not what people now are reduced to. They'll think, oh, what's in it for me? I don't care whether he's talking the truth or not. That's not for me. I don't want to know. All I want is what I get in a house. I is getting money to pay my bills. I can go to Scarlet every month and he'll give me three hundred or three thousand dollars. So you see, we have a, we're in a quandary, you know, we're in a dilemma right there. Yes. But, um, in conclusion, Judith, can you tell me how important to you, to your formative uh, ideas, the formation of your ideas, rather, your formative years, how important was the Girl Guides movement? Oh, well, man. You know, after something I always remember, guides smells and sings under every difficulty. Remember that guy say, say, it, say it again, say it again. A guide sings and smiles under every difficulty. A guide sings and smiles under every difficulty. One of so that was your motto. That was your and motto. His, and my mother always said that. She always had something saying to never complain, never explain. You know? So girl guides taught us a discipline that you wouldn't have got. I mean, we got this through the road, but Girl Guide being in that organization, I see a lot of people when the Girl Guide movement, they, they, they became performers, they were achievers, you know? It carried them through. And I, I think that is lacking the, the scout movement and the girl and all those organizations, even Road Tricky One, these all those things have disappeared, 4-H Club, you know? Those things taught you a certain discipline. And then it taught just a sense of community as well. Giving a volunteer, I saw that volunteerism. You had to work, bother a job to get anything. You didn't go begging people with a list and just expect to get money. You had to work for it, do bother a job. You had to do little tasks and you're paid for it, but you had to work. You had to work to earn. Now people want to earn without working. You know? Uh, would you happen to have any pictures of yourself as a girl guide? Can you take some pictures of the best ones with you individually and you with your troop and send to me kindly? Yes. I 
because I think I'll do a separate article just on you and the Girl Guides movement. That's a separate essay, right? And I will want to put some of those pictures in the essay. I was district commissioner. I was I was commissioner when we became when we when we became members of the Girl Guides World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. Was I don't even heard that. Mrs. Bascom and myself are the ones who went to Kenya to be accepted as when Dominica was accepted as an associate member of that organization, worldwide organization. Worldwide it's Organization the of Girl Guides. Yeah, World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, WAGS. And even on a Dominica stamp, you know, a picture, I'll have a stamp of myself. They, give, they made a stamp with me for, to, to commemorate that event. Amazing. Yes, I can send them to you. Sorry. And if you, any, if, if you have any, like, um, let's say, certificates of commendation, I'll just take a picture of it as well. Yes, okay. Well, we'll have to look for that. I have all, all those things there. Yeah, but the, the photos are good to start. And, and so yes. I just want to thank you, Judith, for your service. Thank I want you. to thank the Garway family for its contributions to agriculture, industry, marine industry, building of boats, the relief. I mean, I learned something today that I didn't know. Education. Education, the PSS, how the PSS came to be. So the two articles I see coming out of this as a separate as separate matters is the PSS, how it came to be, including the um, Portsmouth Hospital. And um, of course the 25 cents per square foot uh, to, to get that school built. No, Pat didn't talk about banking. Pat, would you like to talk about banking? Manager in Dominica. She was the first woman bank manager in Dominica of Bank Francais when she was recruited. She was head on to form that bank. You knew of Bank Francais, right? She's, uh, Pat, I think, is not, she's not listening. Pat, you're muted. Unmute your mic. Un oh, unmute, okay, right. I just unmuted. Um, uh, Ju yeah. Judith just reminded me that you were the first woman bank manager in Dominican history. Yes. How did that happen? Well, I I, I worked at um, Barclays Bank and um, I was accountant. I was loans manager, and in fact, I was I was the first woman to run a, a, an agency for Barclays at Portsmouth. I used to go up and down to Margaret. As the first woman running for policeman to open, um, to do banking for the bank at Marigot, we used to go up and down every day. And then I had asked to be transferred to Portsmouth because my father had fallen ill and I wanted to be there. So they transferred me and I worked there till he passed. And then I was transferred back to Roseau because of upward mobility. And then, you know, I used to complain to the, that those days, you know, you had, you used to take, they used to do your report, but they would hide, put a piece of paper over the, the, the percentage, the marks you would get, whether it's, in, you know, um, <laughs> coming late, being, um, 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 going more than that mile and so on. And then they'll tell you your assessment. So I remember telling the gentleman who used to come from Barbados to do that. Imagine that. I told him, but this is like a secret society. How do you expect me to improve? If I cannot even see where I'm, I'm weak or where I should improve. Imagine it was like a, a, a concentration camp, you know, in those days. <laughs> you, you used to get $4.50, no matter how many hours you worked over time. That was it. They didn't give hours and 50 cents a day? No, you would get, you work. I worked, imagine when I got my first job at Barclays Bank, I got $140 a month. And what year was and that? Well, that was what 19. I left the 10 years in 79, so that must have been 69 or around 68, 69. Okay. And if you worked overtime, no matter if you stayed five hours or six hours, you only got four dollars and fifty cents for the overtime. And those are the days you had ledgers where you used to write pound shillings and pence, and you had no calculators. And you didn't make a mistake, you know, Greg Gabriel. No, I'm seeing. If you go to a shop to add two items, they need a calculator. I'm telling you, but that's the amount that I don't need a calculator. They, they, they can't do, I, I'll never forget, um, my brother is married to um, 
Um, Let me get my no. charger. And One minute. She, she, um, um, Tony, Tony, send a charger for me, please. My charger. I'll catch it. But it's not charging zero nine percent. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm Gabriel. Yes. I remember when I was uh, when we had gone to that camp in Barbados for for the cadet call, right? Um, you can hear me. You can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, Julia um, Johnson. Earl Johnson was the commander at the time, right? So he made me um um what do you call it? He made me commander, guard commander, guard yes. commander, right? Because I was a corporal, because the other guys didn't have nothing to use. They think God commanded. So, anyways, what happened is I, I fell asleep as a guard. Eh? I fell asleep. Yes. You know what the guys did? They mushed me, eh? They yes. Put, they put polish in my hair and glue too, even glue. <laughs> they put glue in my hair. When I <laughs> when I got up, boy, I couldn't even touch my hair. My hand was sticking in it. <laughs> But yes. Mushin was a big thing in the cadet corps. Yeah, and yeah. they did it in my time too. They would call gate on your face, yeah. polish and so on, you know. Vix vapor rub under your eyes. If you open your eyes, it vix, you know. Yeah, that, that was notorious. So so yes, so um so yes, Gabriel. So I was trying to put my um charger on. So yeah. anyway, so and then I was the first woman president of the chamber. So six years, I served with. So you're the first the woman president of the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, first woman. I I I served two terms, six years, and then I was the only woman. All the others were men. That were the directors, and I mean, and those are the days we had a very successful situation because it was during the term of the Freedom Party, and I mean, in those days when you went to Eugenia. You had to have your facts. You couldn't just go and say, well, we need this, we need a said, I need the evidence. And you had people that brilliant people, Norman Rule. You had Antoine Raffle, you had Tony Burnett, you had Curtis Town, you had Blackman, you had um on all um there's another one that was um and Paul Green. I mean, when they did the analysis, you know, I mean, and when you went to Eugenia, you expected success because Ali Glazer was the financial secretary at the time. And boy, were they um, very strict and they were strong. And when you went to go with your issues, you had to come well prepared. I mean, nowadays it's a joke. It's yeah. really a joke, you know. So you're saying that the importance of business organizations like the Chamber of Commerce meant a lot for the society. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I don't know why my thing is not charging. My thing well, I can hear you very well. I mean, I can hear you and I can see you very well. Yes, I don't know and, why. And the question that I, I must ask in light of what um, Judith reminded me, did you have to take any special training to become the first bank manager at Alias oh, well, Process? Well, bank, bank in those days, every department that you went to, you have to be trained. So we would go to Barbados to, for training. You never got a promotion unless you did your exams and all that kind of thing. You know, so we used to go to a training school in Barbados and then, you know, you would become a supervisor, you know, in those days you had bills of collection, you had foreign exchange, you had, you know, loans, you had, I mean, there's name it. Now everything is done from, from St. Lucia Barbados. People hardly make any decisions here, but you had to be properly trained because I mean, in those days, when they recruited you for the bank, you had to be properly qualified and had the potential. And remember, in those days, all your reports and your, your um, what do you call it, when you um, get employed, what's been done in the head office in London, you know? Yes. You know? Let, yes. So right. let, me, let me ask you, and in that time, you didn't have any personal computers to do personal computing. No, man, nothing like that. I, in fact, my handwriting was one of the best. So they always took me to do the ledgers. At lines, you know, you have to en en enter. 
each item, you know, if you had office expenses, if you had, you know, in terms of um, a sale, if you had um, late hours, if you, everything you had to put in the invoice and under each heading, you put in the amount and you had and to have your, and you- All you, by hand. You, all by hand. And I remember we used to rule off with a ruler. You, you couldn't make a, one dot, you know, everything had to be neat and properly done. You know what I mean? And do your totals. You had no calculators. Yes. No calculators. I'm wondering how we did it. Yes. And I was talking before you interrupted to go for the for the um, charger about the mental math. I go into a store recently. You said and the, the, you bought two items and the lady couldn't make couldn't do the mental math. But, ev but everywhere you go to, the, they take a calculator. You just add it. Any supermarket you go to. I mean, now they have the machines, but some of them take calculators to add two items. Yes. I told her, but I've already done it total. <laughs> so I was saying to you that my brother and his wife, who had been in banking forever, she went to a, um, uh, we went to a mall to get some ice cream. Uh -huh. and, you know, it was like something like three fifty and three fifty seven dollars <laughs> And the, girl, the, the, car, the, the machine was broken. The machine was broken. So uh -huh. she gave the girl ten dollars, a ten dollar bill, and the girl couldn't make the change, and she started, so she started crying. You know, she she was so embarrassed. So my 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 uh, my, my sister in law just went behind and took the took the change, and she told her how to do it, and she so she got so embarrassed, you know, <laughs> because she just couldn't she couldn't do seven from ten, you know. So anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm because never, because I'm, the machine, you know, if you get reliant on the machine, you just do the machine. You yes. know, you put in what the, the thing is, they give you the money and the machine tells you everything and, and gives you even the change. So yes. she just couldn't do it. You know, the but, young girl but, couldn't but, do it. But something else, Gabriel, is um, when you're talking about, um, you know, the, um, civics, I mean, when you think of it, people are using the flag. I remember Mr. Signoret, um, Judy was involved in the book that they had done about your flag. And people are making bar suits to the flag. They're putting, tying their heads to the flag. They're putting masks in the flag. So it means people are not really, they pride in country and self. It's no longer existent. And yes, that needs yes. to come back. Because if you have no pride in yourself, no pride in your country, you can't have a pride in anything else. Yes, indeed. Yes, Symbols indeed. Symbols of nationhood. I was going to come with you, Mr. Symbols Steve. of nationhood. That's correct. That's yes, correct. I well, I'm chilling with myself, senior red. Well, I just want to commend, I want to just commend you, Pat, and uh, Judith and uh, Derek for this morning. Uh, you know, it's been a very, very important exchange. I have gotten to learn a lot that I didn't know. And as I said, separate from the transcript, I asked Derek to send me pictures of his cadetting days. Judith, you send me pictures of your time with the... Um, guide movement and um, of course we'll do something separate on pss but i also would like to get some information on the chamber of commerce during the time that pat was the president of the chamber of commerce and those things are very important the president of the anyway, there's so much more yes yes but I this is just the beginning yes uh -huh, yes and um do you want a family picture in terms of when we were yes we had a, i think that's very important we have one to do judith you would have that and what you'd have to do is below send me an email that shows you know the, the yes. names and so on. Yeah. You know? But but um, uh, thank you so much again for that. Uh, the whole idea again is making the record, right? And uh, this morning it was either Pat or Judith who sent me something on my island story. So I was yes, trying to yes. read it, but it seems you have to register. No, no, first. no, no. You don't have to. If if you click on it, eventually it opens up and it's a very. It's like reading a book, eh? Okay. I thought so too, but if you yeah, click on the something now, if um um Gabriel, if you if you click on the picture, let me show him. Hello. Well, let me let me wrap up the interview. Let me yes. wrap up the interview, and then I will I, I will um. So, we're well, thanking you once again and signing off at uh, one o one Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. Well, I was I just wanted to show you based on.